a stock there. Uh, so there may be wider issues to come out of this. We'll be looking at it in detail as well. Thank you. That ends topical questions. We now move to next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12095 in the name of Alex Neal on tackling inequalities. I'll give a few moments for members to change their seats. Thank you. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Rosanna Cunningham to speak to and move the motion in the name of Alex Neal, Cabinet Secretary, 14 minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as members will know, over the last six years, we've seen many changes to Scotland's labour market. There's been a marked increase in part-time work and an increase in self-employment. And many employers have taken the opportunity to introduce new ways of contracting with employments, he, employees, hence the rise in zero hours and fixed term contracts. At the same time, and probably as a direct consequence of these changes, underemployment is now widespread and real wages have fallen. And these new ways of working are gradually eroding the employment protections built up over many decades. And as bad as it is when any business goes under, it is even worse when many people dependent on that business for their livelihoods find that they have no recourse to any of the legal protections that might once have been available. Real wages, as I said, have fallen. And there is now a substantial and measurable problem of in-work poverty uh, and is getting worse. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation has just published a report on this subject and this morning the Scottish Government published evidence on the extent of in-work poverty in Scotland. Those most likely to receive low pay are women, young people, older workers, people without qualifications, some ethnic minorities, lone parents and disabled people. Women are more likely to work in low paying sectors and more likely to be employed part time, which has a substantial overlap with low pay. And this means that even though employment levels have grown significantly since 2008 for a growing proportion of those in employment, job quality, measured in terms of remuneration, job security, fair contractual terms, opportunities for progression and engagement, is poor. There is an increased sense of disconnection between business success and a share of the benefits of that success accruing to employees. Presiding officer, this government is absolutely of the view that these changes are bad for the economy. Inequality is holding back the life chances of the lowest earners in Scotland's population and acts as a significant break on productivity and growth. And the latest evidence from the OECD suggests that income inequality has a significant negative impact on growth. Policies to reduce income inequalities should be pursued not only to improve social outcomes, but also to sustain long-term growth. Now, we did publish our revised child poverty strategy in March with outcomes focused on what we call the three Ps, pockets, prospects and places. We aim to maximise household incomes, improve children's life chances and provide sustainable places. The, strat the strategy includes actions across a variety of areas and the approach was reflected in the commitments the First Minister made in the programme for government. And that programme sets out a range of cross-portfolio policies aimed at reducing inequality. It includes actions around fair work, part of the focus uh, for this debate. This includes our commitments to pay the living wage and increased funding to the Poverty Alliance to grow the number of accredited living wage employers. It also sets out a focus on school attainment and university access for those from disadvantaged backgrounds. And that's being taken forward by my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning. And commitments to support increased childcare and free school meals, of course, which has been the subject of more recent discussion. And these policies are designed to help reduce intergenerational poverty and tackle inequality. Yes, of course. Neil Findlay. Can I ask which of those policies or any other policies takes money from those who are the most wealthy in our society and puts it into the pockets of those who are least wealthy 
and that is under the control of the Scottish Government. Well, the last phrase is the key, of course, because what would actually help us do something about that is precisely what the Labour Party does not want us to have, powers over tax, benefits and employment law. The programme for government also emphasises our commitment to empower communities by handing over decisions on key issues uh, to them and to make government open and accessible through public participation in the decisions we make that affect them. We've committed to poverty-proofing all of our new policies and legislation through the use of poverty impact assessments whenever we make a change. And we will appoint an independent advisor on poverty and inequality to hold public events with the First Minister to raise awareness of the reality of living in poverty, make recommendations to the government on how collectively we should respond and hold the government to account on its performance. However, we know that poverty levels are increasing in Scotland because of UK government policies. Scottish government analysis estimates that the price Scotland has had to pay as a result of the UK government's cuts and changes to the welfare system could total around £6 billion in the six years to 2015-16. And one of the depressing outcomes has been the massive rise in the numbers of people using food banks. It is clearly unacceptable that so many people in Scotland are living in food poverty. We continue to make this point to UK ministers as we press them on the impacts their decisions on welfare are having in Scotland. Presiding officer, in my opening comments, I mentioned the rise in in-work poverty. It is an absolute scandal that the majority of working age adults in poverty in Scotland, indeed throughout the UK, are living in households where at least one adult is in employment. And for children, the figure is 59%. Now, we've made various commitments uh, uh, to what we call the social wage uh, that extends certain core universal services, rights and benefits to deliver the social and economic circumstances for everyone to benefit. I won't re rehearse them all here. Uh, the Chamber is very well aware of them. And I want to focus more specifically on some of the areas that fall within my portfolio, uh, the first of being the living wage. Uh, all the policies that, uh, uh, that I've uh, talked about uh, with reference to the social wage, and some of them, for example, free school meals that I've specifically referred to, are designed to help hard-pressed families and individuals, as indeed are our commitments on the living wage. Now, despite sharp reductions imposed on the Scottish budget by the UK government, we've managed to incorporate a number of distinct measures within our pay policy to actively protect the pay of our lowest earning public sector workers. And that includes a commitment to support the Scottish living wage for the duration of this parliament to 2015-16. And as I said earlier, we've provided further funding to the Poverty Alliance to promote take up of the living wage accreditation scheme. We've set a target for at least 150 accredited employers by the end of 2015, and some members may have picked up that yesterday the First Minister visited the 100th such employer to be signed up. This will help increase the number of employers paying the living wage in all sectors in Scotland to make decent pay the standard in our country. Now, EU... Well, perhaps... If, well, OK. Ken McIntosh. Uh, can I, can I uh, welcome the Minister's comments? Can I ask, as well as tackling pay at the bottom, does the Minister have any views about tackling excess pay at the top? Cabinet Secretary. The Minister has a great many views about tackling excess pay uh, at the top. Uh, it's just a pity that the party to which the member belongs doesn't appear to have very much uh, to say about that either. And it is a great pity that the party opposite is not interested in giving this uh, Parliament uh, powers to do something in a statutory sense uh, about all of the issues that we're raising uh, today. We're going to help increase the number of employers paying the living wage in all sectors in Scotland to make decent pay the standard in our country. EU law prevents the payment of the living wage being mandated as part of a public procurement exercise. And despite others' claims to the contrary, the position under EU law has been made clear in a number of rulings of the European Court of Justice and in correspondence between the Scottish Government and the European Commission. Making the living wage mandatory through contracts is not possible under EU law where the statutory national minimum wage has been set at a lower level. And that, of course, is why the SNP Government asked the Smith Commission to recommend devolving responsibility for the national minimum wage to the Scottish Parliament, something that the Labour Party chose not to support. Labour members refused to support the devolution of responsibility uh, for that to Scotland, 
Uh, and that's a move which would have allowed the Scottish Parliament to determine what level it should be set at. We've consistently explained that while we cannot make the living wage mandatory, we can strongly encourage it. And this is what the Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014 seeks to do in providing for the issue of statutory guidance on workforce matters in procurement. And my colleague Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure and Investment in Cities, is currently consulting key stakeholders, including the ICI Committee, STUC, Trade Unions and the Poverty Alliance, on draft guidelines for purchasers on how to tackle workforce matters in procurement. And we are, of course, also leading by example with the Scottish Government successfully encouraging bidders to offer bids that were placed based on paying their staff the living wage when we recently tendered our catering contract. In addition, we've worked with our existing cleaning contractor to ensure that its staff who work in our core premises will also receive at least the living wage. And we continue to encourage all public bodies and businesses to follow our lead on this important matter. Presiding officer, if I could expand uh, uh, some of the issues that have to do on the broader question of fair work. Uh, I'm glad this parliament showed overwhelming support for the Working Together review and its recommendations when first debated on the 13th of November uh, last year. We're always focused on securing the best outcomes for Scotland. We believe, and the Working Together review confirmed, that progressive workplace policies can help to improve a firm's productivity and innovation and can aid sustainable growth. Well rewarded and sustained employment is the best route out of poverty and the best way to tackle inequality. And that's why there will be a Fair Work Convention and that's why it will prioritise the promotion of the living wage to highlight the fact that business productivity goes hand in hand with decent, fair and equal pay. And in support of our approach that fairness supports and underpins long-term prosperity, we will develop a Scottish business pledge. And this will invite companies to commit, for example, to extending the living wage involving their local communities and investing in youth training and employment. And in return, they'll be offered a package of tailored support on skills, innovation and exports uh, to help them grow and prosper. Against the background of recession and continued Westminster austerity, our strategy for developing Scotland's young workforce is delivering. Recent employment statistics for Scotland have been encouraging and we have record numbers of people in work. Youth unemployment in Scotland is at a five-year low, and I would expect people to uh, really welcome that. Uh, and Scotland is outperforming the United Kingdom as a whole in youth unemployment, in employment, and in youth inactivity rates. But we still have more to do. We want to tackle long-term issues in the labour market and barriers to young women and men getting into jobs. And last year, we said that we would be able to increase the annual number of new modern apprenticeship starts, taking the number to 30,000 a year by 2020. We've set ambitious targets for our young workforce, and the Parliament will recall in December, I brought forward the Developing the Young uh, Workforce Scotland's Youth Employment Strategy to the Chamber, uh, setting out an ambitious seven-year programme uh, on which we will report on a regular basis. The key performance indicators there covered a range of measures and have a particular focus on addressing inequality. They look to increase the minority gender share in the largest and most imbalanced college superclasses, increase employment rate for young disabled people to the population average and increase the number of modern apprenticeship starts from minority ethnic communities. So we will be reporting each year on these ambitions. Uh, and in implementing this programme, it will put us where we belong among the best performing countries in Europe. And above all, our seven-year programme will be a collaborative effort. Government cannot do this on its own, which is why our programme has been developed in conjunction with our partners in local government and with Scotland's employers and trade unions. Presiding officer, in concluding, we all have a part to play in developing a fairer and more equal Scotland, and we are going to have to work together, frankly, to do so. I'm sure that those present today would agree that these are issues which motivate us all and that this Parliament, like the Scottish Government, must continue to make strong commitments to tackle them. We need to work together here as well as out in the country if we're going to actually achieve what we want to do. And the achievement is set out in the motion before you, which I now move, Presiding Officer. Well Many thanks, Cabinet Secretary. And I now call on Ken McIntosh to speak to and to move Amendment 12095.4. Ten minutes, please. 
Thank you, President Officer. I would like to congratulate the Minister for bringing forward today's motion on tackling inequalities, particularly on her timing. Uh, many of us will hear the news this week from Oxfam that the richest 1% of the world's population are on the brink of owning more wealth than the rest of us put together. 1% own half of all global wealth. And that's obscene, that's immoral. But what is worse is it's damaging. It's damaging to our economy, damaging to our society, damaging to the values that should bind us together. And what I find particularly worrying is not just the levels of extreme inequality, but the fact that the problem is getting worse. The inequality gap is continuing to widen. As most families have struggled through the past half dozen years of recession, frozen wages and rising prices, the number of billionaires has actually doubled. Now, I believe that is positively dangerous. It is so unfair, it is difficult to imagine it will not breed resentment. But simply in terms of our responsibilities and our record as members of the Scottish Parliament, it's a poor reflection on our political structures, our public policies and our democratic accountability that we have allowed such inequality to develop. Now, the good news is that there are strong signs the world has woken up to inequality. I know that many here in this chamber, for example, have quoted from that seminal book, The Spirit Level. Oxfam are just one of the many organisations leading the way in challenging this threat to our way of life with their campaign to even it up. And they, in turn, quote from supporters as diverse as Pope Francis and the International Monetary Fund. And yes, the Scottish Government have woken up too. I'm pleased the Government has brought forward today's motion. But I'm also slightly anxious. I am worried that the Minister believes that such a complex problem can simply be blamed on the UK Government, while everything we do here in Scotland is beneficial. Now, I share her belief that Tory policies of austerity and welfare reform are making matters worse, not better. But we, and I mean all of us here in the Scottish Parliament, have to accept responsibility for the decisions we take too. Educational attainment is widening, the gap is widening, yet responsibility for our schools, colleges and universities has been entirely devolved to this Parliament for the last 16 years. Progress in narrowing health inequalities has stagnated and in some cases getting worse, yet health has been entirely devolved to this Parliament for the last 16 years. Sorry, I'll give way to... Mark McDonald. I, I accept the points the member raises, but is the member not also aware that much of the evidence that has been received on these issues suggests that at the point at which a child arrives at the school gate or an individual arrives at their GP, often the inequalities that affect their health or their educational attainment have already taken hold, and by that point uh, it's managing a situation rather than tackling it? Ken McIntosh. Yes, the, the, the member makes a good point about the impact uh, of uh, socioeconomic background, which I'll come on to. Um, but, but if he was to follow the logic of his own argument, it's a, it's a logic of despair. What he's suggesting is that we can't actually tackle he health inequalities using health policies. And I, I simply don't agree with that. I simply don't agree that we make no difference through our educational and health policies that we decide here in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, Minister MacDonald. The Scottish Government has had Labour support and will continue to have our support in pursuing policies which are fair. But too often, SNP ministers confuse the pursuit of equity with the goal of tackling inequality. And free university tuition is just one example. It's a policy Scottish Labour supports because it is equitable. But unless it is accompanied by action to widen access to Scots from all backgrounds, it does little to reduce inequality. And unfortunately, the SNP's record on widening access is actually worse than that of the Tory government in England, despite their horrendous fees. In one minute. In fact, the evidence clearly reveals that Scots from less well-off backgrounds are more likely to go to college than university. So not only are we not opening the door to higher education, ministers here in Edinburgh have actually slammed the door shut to further education from more than 140,000 Scots. Now, we all know that education, skills and training... I will in one second, Minister. We all know that education, skills and training provide one of the best routes out of poverty, one of the best ways to tackle social mobility, one of the best ways to overcome inequality. But if in Scotland you have to be middle class to access higher education in the first place, we're not reducing inequality. We are actually preserving it. Uh, Minister. Cabinet I wonder if Mr McIntosh would accept that uh, statistics show that there's a 40% increase 
and young people from disadvantaged backgrounds going into higher education. I wonder if you would accept that, but also in the spirit of unity, um, accept that there is, of course, uh, a need for much more to be done. And that's why a main feature of the programme for government was to uh, uh, set up the Commission for uh, Widening Access, which will be announced in a few weeks' time. Ken McIntosh. Again, I don't doubt the Minister's good intentions, nor her desire to tackle this area, but the, the, the worrying fact is that one of the biggest victims of the Scottish Government's decision-making were the most vulnerable people in our society. The ones that... The, those who have supported places at college and university were the ones who suffered the biggest cuts when the education reforms went through in the last few years. Now, that's just unfortunately a sad reflection. Not, not, not at the moment. I'll make some progress. Now, even if we are to put education and health to one side for a moment and follow Mr Macdonald's point that we take an entirely economic determinist view of inequality, there's still so much we can do here in the Scottish Parliament. The Minister, for example, rightly highlights the importance of wages. But the Scottish Government only seems to want to go halfway with its support for the living wage. Now, much as we are delighted that she has partly adopted yet another Labour Party policy, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad the SNP are coming round to our way of thinking on this and on so many other issues. But perhaps when the Minister could understand, can explain, because I don't understand why it does not insist that any company enjoying a public sector contract should not have an obligation to pay staff the minimum wage. And why, because I asked the Minister this, and she was slightly touchy about it, I was asking the Minister a straightforward point, why does the Minister not support, or the Cabinet Secretary not support wage differentials? The living wage will lift people out of poverty, and it, it will help make work pay. But if top salaries increase faster, than the, as they have done, then the inequality gap will actually widen. It won't narrow. Now, the Minister may so believe this is solely a question for FTSE Top 100 companies, but as it happens, the Equality Trust have worked out that uh, I think it's uh, none, that none of the largest companies bidding for public sector contracts in the UK pay the Chief Executive less than 59 times UK median earnings. These are public sector contracts they are getting. And even more directly, uh, we are rightly proud of our universities, but while they are one of the worst offenders in employing people on zero-hours contracts, they're also guilty of paying university principals salaries of quarter of a million pounds or more. And in this case, this is taxpayers' money we are talking about. Do the ministers not see the contradiction in voting through a series of consecutive wage freezes or capped 1% rises on those lower down the public sector while allowing those increases for those at the top? Now, I, I repeat once more... We are not saying that everything the SNP does is wrong. Far from it. We have common ground in so many areas. But we can't blind ourselves to the difference we could make here in the Scottish Parliament. There are so many contributions we can make. Just return to education. Investment in the early years is most likely to pay dividends. Yet despite the Scottish Parliament's tremendous expansion of nursery education in the first years of this Parliament, we've been overtaken by the, uh, England under the Tories of all people, where more places are available for vulnerable two years than here in Scotland. And we don't have to look very far in Scotland to see how entrenched inequality has become. Fewer than 500 people now own half the private land in Scotland. In fact, 10% of all land in Scotland is owned by 16 people. One of our first achievements in the Scottish Parliament was to finally abolish feudal ownership and introduce the right for community buyouts. But the drive for land reform has made little progress. The First Minister made encouraging noises. I hope when she can translate these words into actions, we certainly in, in Scottish Labour will offer our support. And there are, there are many other areas of agreement where we should be exploring. If we agree, for example, that Scotland suffers, that our society and our economy is damaged by unacceptable levels of inequality, I think we have the right to know where the SNP stand on the redistribution of wealth. Now, this is a basic Scottish Labour Party principle and one reflected in our policy choices. We are promising, we are promising the people of Scotland that we will restore the top level of 50% tax on all incomes over 150,000, we'll introduce a mansion tax on houses worth more than 2 million, and we'll tax the multi-million pound bonuses uh, still received by bankers rescued by the taxpayer. Will the, in one second, why will the SNP not match us on those promises? In fact, can I challenge the Minister right now, challenge the Minister right now and the Cabinet Secretary in this debate to commit the SNP to supporting Scottish Labour's pledge to introduce a 50 pence rate of tax. Minister. Cabinet Secretary. I just wonder if the member would care to outline precisely what powers this government would use to impose those tax changes that he's talking about. 
That would need tax powers that his party have no intention of ever devolving to this parliament. Ken McIntosh, and could you start to come to a conclusion? I can give you a little bit of extra time for your interventions, but please start uh, thank to conclude. You. Apart from the fact that we are about to gain powers over this very area, we have a general election coming up. We have a general election coming up on the top rate of tax, on the top rate of income tax. And we have got a general election in a few months. I am asking the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister now, and this will help Cabinet Secretary, will you commit the SNP to reintroducing the top rate of income? I don't understand what's so difficult about it. Why will you not actually? Why is it? Why is it that the only tax that you're willing to talk about are tax cuts for corporations, and you will not talk about the basic principle yeah. of redistribution of wealth? Mr. McIntosh, please suggest your remarks. I would do, uh, the chair. Presenting officer, I wanted to make some points about uh, the, in the poverty and the, the inequality experienced by disabled people in Scotland. But I clearly, I've run out of time. I can I'll give you around another time. thirty seconds for the interventions well, that you took. I, I, the point I want to make is that with these inequalities, the, the divider society, there are challenges facing us all in the here and now. They will not solely by sol be solved by getting rid of the Tories, no matter how beneficial and desirable that will be. We need to start looking, we need to start looking at our own decision-making, our own powers, our own Scottish Parliament, and start Order, to work please. on building the good society the people of Scotland want and need. Reducing inequality would be a great place to start. Thank you, President Officer. I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And to now call on Alex Johnson to speak to and to move Amendment 12095.2 in around six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by uh, moving the amendment, which stands in my name, uh, lest I forget to do that at the end? The issue of tackling inequalities is something which is fundamental to a parliament of this nature. People out there are, by and large, aspirational. They want to better themselves. They want to get themselves into a better position and find a better position still for their children. I and my party have always talked about equality, but as is the case in many discussions, we have perhaps talked of it in a slightly different tone. I can remember many of my contemporaries, as I made my way up through politics, talking about equality of opportunity. That doesn't mean that everyone will have the same treatment. It doesn't mean that everyone will have the same income or the same possessions. But it does mean that young people starting out in life will have the same chances that anyone else has of achieving that, their aspirations during their lifetime. That's why it's extremely important to me to be able to put the conservative angle on this debate. Of course, equalities means different things to different people, but I think we all have an understanding today that what we're talking about are those who find themselves in a disadvantaged position in Scotland today and how we might elevate them. We've heard a fair bit from the Labour Party already about the issue of the redistribution of wealth. And I think the redistribution of wealth through taxation will always be part of the Scottish political agenda, in spite of the fact that I may be less keen on it than some others. But the redistribution of wealth itself is an irrelevance unless we first apply ourselves at least as equally to the creation of that wealth. And that's where our current UK government have done so well. We've seen 160,000 extra jobs created in Scotland since 2010. And although many people will talk of the quality of these jobs, three quarters of them are full time. I'm afraid I can't take an intervention at this point. Three quarters of these jobs are full time. Other concerns are that Scotland has been successful in attracting a great many immigrants, particularly from Eastern Europe in that time. Now, I will put down the marker I always do. I am one of the few Conservatives that will never object to Eastern European immigration because I believe they make a vital contribution to the Scottish economy. What does concern me is that we have failed to get our own unemployed into these jobs when they were, were created. The Government complains that it does not have power over tax. But, of course, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government has had power over tax since 1999. It could vary it by 3% uh, either way of the base rate. Next year, it will have more powers. And with the publication of the White Paper this week, we will hear about the extra powers we will get to vary income tax 
more or less as we see fit. The protests of the Minister appear to indicate that she wasn't talking about in income tax at all. It makes me worry that she's perhaps talking about wealth and inheritance tax, which she will not have under the current proposals. Welfare reform will produce an important part of the change we need to achieve. The universal credit, when it comes along, will give flexibility for the first time to allow people to get back into work while not losing the advantage of all their benefits. That flexibility will also lead to responsibility and opportunities to take responsibility for dealing with their own resources, including paying their rent, will be a vital part of that change. And that's why the budget for welfare in Scotland is actually going up, not down. As is pointed out in the um, amendment in the name of Willie Rennie, a textbook amendment, if ever I saw one, in fact, I think he's copied the textbook out, uh, there is a £2 billion rise in welfare coming in the next two years. The Minister complains that there have been £6 billion worth of cuts in the current five-year spending period. Well, that's to measure the cuts without measuring the pluses. The fact is that many of these reductions that are within her £6 billion are in fact the removal of tax credits, tax credits which have been replaced with a massive increase in tax thresholds that will, by April this year, deliver over £800 to every working individual. I'm afraid I'm just coming to the end of remarks, my remarks. The problem is the one we had addressed at the beginning, equality of opportunity. While wealth is being created in Scotland, while jobs are being created in Scotland and jobs are being taken up in Scotland, we are not delivering the opportunity for our young people to get into these jobs in sufficient numbers. Our schools and our colleges, as well as our universities, are failing to deliver the correct qualifications and aspirations to those in certain areas. This is not a failure of the UK Government. This is a failure of the Scottish Government and a failure that has continued over time. And that's not to mention the health inequalities that are obviously requiring set cycles to be broken. The Member's not giving me, Mr Jones. We need also to take seriously the issue of the living wage. My concern has been expressed in this Parliament before. My concern is that the living wage, is an, while it's an aspiration we should all pursue, doesn't take account of the many small businesses who will struggle to pay it, and many of them, the proprietors of these businesses, who will never be able to achieve that level of income. And that's particularly poignant when you consider that many of our ethnic and immigrant communities have many of these small businesses within them. Deputy Presiding Officer, this is an important debate and one which I think we need to take very seriously. And we all need to understand each other's position, which will be different, but has the same objective, only a different route to achieve it. Thank you. And I now call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move Amendment 1209.5.1. Six minutes or so, Mr Rennie. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I want to actually start where Alex Johnson finished off. There is no monopoly of virtue on tackling inequality or poverty in this chamber. We all just have different routes for trying to achieve that. And I think respecting each other for what we are trying to do in this area, I think, is something that we could all learn from. Any kind of, even one child living in poverty, I regard as unacceptable. And too many children born in this country into poverty die in poverty. And they're also their life expectancy is so much shorter than many other people who are not suffering from poverty. So inequality is something that divides our society and something that I want to try and tackle as a Liberal. And I believe the best way of trying to achieve that is combining the great benefits of building a stronger economy but also a fairer society so that everyone gets an opportunity regardless of their background, no matter where they come from, no matter what position they're born into and no matter um, what their race, colour or creed. That is a very strong liberal principle and something I will always adhere to. Because without, not just now, without fairness, it is difficult to create a truly strong economy. And without a strong economy, 
fairness. One is not possible without the other. And that's why this government, the UK government, since 2010, Alex Johnson is quite right, has created, actually it's more than 160,000 jobs, is 168,000 jobs since 2010. And despite what the SNP government claim, the vast bulk of those are actually full-time jobs and skilled jobs. We've got in the United Kingdom one of the fastest growing economies in the G7. So that means we have 168,000 more wage packets going into households and 168,000 households that have got a better opportunity in life. So in tandem with economic growth, we've also introduced the biggest ever change to our income tax system ever introduced. Raising the tax threshold to £10,600 means that 260,000 people, the lowest paid households, the lowest income earners in Scotland are now paying no income tax whatsoever. That is very progressive. And those on low and middle incomes are benefiting too. Over 2 million taxpayers, not just now, over 2 million taxpayers in Scotland have had their tax cut by over £800. No matter how loud he shouts, he doesn't get taken. Um, I'll give the Minister. An Cabinet answer. Secretary. Listening with care to Willie Rennie's uh, expounding of how much better things are getting, I wonder if he's actually seen the in-work poverty stats that were published this morning. And if he has seen them, could he explain how we see such a rise against the backdrop of... Uh, uh, the wonderful picture which he is painting. Well, the, the reality is that we are facing a very difficult economic circumstance. What this government... They scoff, the SNP minister scoff, but the reality is that it is this UK government that has made the biggest change to our tax system, which has lifted a lot of people out of income tax altogether. And if we had listened to the SNP government, they would have not received any of that benefit, because we remember from the White Paper they did not support the Liberal Democrat proposal to go even further and lift the tax threshold up to 12,500. They just wanted to increase it with inflation. That would not have benefited low- and middle-income earners. So I'll take no lectures from the SNP government on trying to incentivise people into work and make it fairer in work too. And we want to go further Members to 12,500 pounds. And that, again, will mean that people who are on minimum wage will be taken out of income tax altogether. That is a significant benefit to people on low incomes and on those in low income households. So by increasing the minimum wage also, we are making a big difference to those on low pay. And that's why um, Vince Cable has been advocating to the Low Pay Commission an acceleration of the, the increase in the national minimum wage. And that started last October. And for the first time now, we are seeing wages rising faster than inflation. The first time for many, many years. Again, that is good prospects to improve the conditions for people who are working. So that's one half of the equation, to try and tackle this inequality gap, to try and make a stronger economy. But the second part is what government can do to increase opportunity. And despite the SNP's fine words, on improving childcare. We are still lagging behind England on childcare. We've only got 27% of the poorest children in Scotland benefiting from nursery education for two-year-olds, whereas in England, we're at 40%. 40%, so much more. And you would think from the rhetoric from the SNP benches that in Scotland it was far superior, but the reality is that we are lagging behind. Well, I've actually only got 30 seconds. I would love to perhaps... Perhaps in the summing up we can cover this. So on childcare, it is important that the Scottish Government gets its act together. Perhaps listen to the fine words of Bob Dorison, who has made some great speeches in this regard. And I think it's important that we move even further on childcare. And also on mental health. Mental health is another area of public life where the Scottish Government need to lift their efforts so that more people can get back into work because so many are blighted by poor quality service within the NHS on providing and tackling mental illness. So creating a stronger economy and a fairer society is necessary in order to reduce inequality and that's something that Liberal Democrats will always adhere to. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. We now turn to the open debate speeches of six minutes, please. There's a little bit of time in hand at the moment for interventions. Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Poverty Alliance highlighted in a briefing the extent of in-work poverty in Scotland. There are currently 820,000 people living in poverty in Scotland. Of these, 180,000 are children. Overall, 19 per cent of children are living in poverty, and almost two-thirds of these are in households where someone works. Low benefit levels and poor labour market conditions mean that people are finding it harder and harder to make ends meet. While work was once thought to be a route out of poverty, more than half of adults living in poverty today live in households where someone works." End quote. Governments across the world have the ability to put in place policies to tackle poverty in society by setting the minimum wage or designing a welfare system to support families struggling to make ends meet, but not in Scotland. The Scottish Government has no control of either the minimum wage or the welfare system, as they are reserved to Westminster. Since 2008, successive Labour, Conservative and Lib Dem governments have failed to ensure that the minimum wage has kept pace with inflation. The Resolution Foundation calculates that this leaves the minimum wage £1,010 lower a year than it was in 2008. Last year, following the referendum, there were calls to devolve the minimum wage to Holyrood so that we could set the rate here. But once again, Westminster parties failed families in Scotland by not supporting the SNP proposals. When it comes to the changes to the welfare system introduced by the Conservative and Lib Dem coalition, the Scottish Government is left trying to mitigate against the worst aspects rather than being in a position to create a welfare system that is simple, makes work pay and lifts people out of poverty. Over the last year, the Scottish Government has maintained funding for the Scottish Welfare Fund, has offset the cost of the bedroom tax to families and has mitigated the cut in funding for council tax benefit. The difficulty is that, is that the Tories, as part of their austerity measures, are planning to slice billions of working age benefits by freezing child benefit, tax credits and other measures, resulting in a low wage family with one child losing over £350 a year. As the motion states, the work of the Scottish Government's Fair Work Convention to promote and sustain a fair employment framework for Scotland is at risk of being undermined by the £6 billion of cuts being made by the UK Government. The Fair Work Convention is about bringing together unions, employers, public sector bodies and government to promote good industrial relations, highlight the fact that business productivity increases with the payment of fair wages and the promotion of the living wage to employers. The Procurement Bill made it clear that one of the factors that authorities will require to evaluate is a contractor's approach to pay and the living wage. Public authorities will be required to set out in their procurement strategies what their policy is in relation to ensuring that the companies they contract with pay the living wage. Since April 2014, there are now 100 employers in Scotland registered with the Living Wage Accreditation Scheme. These range from builders to universities and from tour companies to local authorities. We need to encourage all those companies and organisations who currently pay the living wage to register. Currently, only one local authority out of 32 is listed as an accredited living wage employer, one distillery out of 90, only one bank is registered, two housing associations, one university and two colleges. Are there really no others in those sectors who pay the living wage? We have 18 per cent of the workforce who are paid below the living wage, and the majority of these are in the private sector and are women. They mainly work either in retail, hospitality or the social sector. Yet we have no supermarkets, hotels or restaurants listed as accredited employers and only a handful of care organisations. The Living Wage Commission, in the report Work That Pays, 
looked at the business case for introducing the living wage. They established that the living wage can open the door to productivity increases for businesses. This is a result of living wage employees contributing higher levels of effort and an openness to changing job roles. Other business benefits include cost-saving opportunities from increasing staff retention and the stability of the workforce, as well as reduced absenteeism. The evidence points to improved levels of morale, motivation and commitment from staff across the pay distribution in living wage workplaces. The Commission also examined the public policy case for introducing living wage and referred to an analysis provided by Ladman Economics that shows that across the UK, the Exchequer could gain up to £4.2 billion in increased tax revenues and reduced expenditure on tax credits and other in-work benefits from an increase in coverage of the living wage. They go on to state that there could be further multiplier effects arising from putting a modest amount of disposable income into the pockets of the UK's lowest paid staff, with demand subsequently increasing in the economy. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has led the way as a living wage employer and some organisations across Edinburgh have stepped up to the mark, including Chai, based in my constituency. You must conclude, please. We need other employers to recognise the benefit to their business, the wider community and society of paying the living wage and lead by example. Thank Many you. thanks. I now call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Health Committee recently held an inquiry into health inequalities, and what was clear from that inquiry was that health inequalities are a symptom of an unequal society rather than the cause. The cause is income inequality, and this in turn leads to inadequate housing, meaning that people are living in cold, damp properties because they can't afford any better. They eat inadequate diets. We all know that pie, beans and chips is much cheaper than a hearty beef stew and potatoes. People don't choose to feed themselves or their families on unhealthy food. They have to or else they go hungry. And it's quite sad that we've seen rickets come back into uh, young people in our society, something that past generations thought they had totally eradicated um, from, from this country. If you're cold and hungry and in poverty, it impacts your physical health, the ability to fight infection and indeed the ability to concentrate. Education is impacted due to the difficulty of studying in a cold home in an empty stomach. A parent's priority becomes keeping the roof over their heads and the heads of their families and trying to feed their children as best as possible. Things like homework become less of a priority when basic survival is difficult. Therefore, children brought up in poverty seldom reach their full potential. We also know that if you're born in poverty, you are more likely to live in poverty. A mother's income influences her child's future income, and therefore we start a vicious cycle of poverty with little hope of changing your life chances. The gender pay gap keeps women's incomes low, and if this equates to their children receiving lower pay in future, we start a cycle of poverty by paying women less. There's no easy fix, and that's why fighting poverty should be cross-department, cross-committee, and indeed, if we're really committed to it, we should, it should be an issue for every organisation, business and individual in the country. We all lose if a child does not grow up to reach their full potential. That is a loss to the whole of society and diminishes what we would have received if they had been able to contribute at their full potential. It also means that society in future will have to intervene to deal with health problems caused by their poverty. And taxpayers must also supplement uh, their income because of the poverty, that people in poverty will never reach their full earning potential. However, had we tackled that in childhood, they would have been contributing to society rather than taking from it. Accessing exercise and recreation is also important to health, but these facilities are often missing from our most needy communities. Deprived areas are beset with social problems, drug taking and the like, which makes parents reluctant to put their children out to pay play, and neither can they afford after-school clubs that many of us take for granted. Even if the facilities were there, is there spare money in the home for a football strip and boots or dance shoes or the like? 
Money is also required to travel to clubs and sporting facilities, and depending on the age of the child, the parent may need to go with them. All of these things have barriers to access and exercise, and children miss out eh, more than exercise because they miss out on the ability to socialise and interact in, and build skills that are very necessary in later life in building relationships, both personally and professionally. Living in poverty and hopelessness also impacts on people's mental health, hence the increase in drug taking and alcohol misuse in poorer communities as people self-medicate to deal with their circumstances. And this in turn impacts on their general health and their ability to nurture their children. How can you instill hope and ambition in your children if you have none yourself? However, it doesn't end there. We know that poverty leads to poorer health and lower life expectancy. Therefore, we need to invest more resources in health and social care for those that suffer in this way. The RCN initiative, Nursing at the Edge, shows what community nursing intervention can do to help change people's circumstances and support them. The Deep End GPs also report on the complex issues they need to deal with on a daily basis. Not only a person's health, but the social circumstances that impact on this health. This means that they require more input from professionals and also closer working between professionals in order to deal with the complex problems they find. However, it's less likely that poorer areas enjoy better services based on need. The inverse care law tends to suggest that those in greatest need tend to receive fewer services. And this can be for a number of reasons. People are less likely to seek medical help because they don't have a sense of entitlement that we have to good health. Services are often some distance away, inaccessible, or comparatively expensive to access through public transport. Daily pressures, such as fighting for survival, often leave little time for taking care of yourself. And if we're to encourage people to access health care sooner, we need to provide that care in a way that's accessible to them and that fits with the pressures and circumstances they face. I think we have some way to go before we achieve that. As a minimum, we need to allow health professionals time to work with people in order that they can signpost them to services that deal with their other problems. Presiding officer, health inequalities can only be tackled by creating a fairer society where wealth is shared and opportunity is open to all. Until that happens, we all need to foot the bill for dealing with the consequences of inequality. We need to ensure that resources are placed where they meet the greatest need. That does require targeting of funding if there's not enough to go around. We all like universal services. However, when there is an inbuilt inequality in our society, we need to target service to those that are most in need first. The alternative is that we all pay more to meet that need. Presiding officer, if we're not willing to acknowledge that, that, we are basically acknowledging that we live in an unfair and selfish society. Many thanks. I now call Christina McKelvey to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Inequality is cyclical and so is self-perpetuating. Start off with low performance in the economy, low pay, children in poverty, people in work needing food banks. Already you have set the pattern for health inequalities, reduced school performance, fewer opportunities to progress into decent employment, and the cycle comes full circle, starting the same depressing journey all over again. Carol Craig in her book, The Tears That Made the Clyde, likened this to the Glasgow effect, but it wasn't just restricted to Glasgow. But it really doesn't need to be like this. Westminster has failed Scotland, with the exception of the already very wealthy in the country estates and grand houses who do rather well under the current government. People are watching their prosperity, their opportunities dwindle at an alarming speed. Increasing levels of poverty and inequality are a clear sign that the economic and social policies of the UK government are failing Scotland. Why spend £100 billion on weapons of mass destruction and not spend £100 billion on the opportunities for our young people? Neil Finlay. Ms McKelvey spoke about those people in grand houses. I wonder if she would, um, I wonder if she would uh, advocate maybe something like increasing the stamp duty for those people in those grand houses. Christina McKelvey. Maybe uh, Mr Finlay should take should take lessons from his colleague who he backed. 
in the recent leadership battle, Katie Clark, and not vote for £30 billion worth of austerity cuts. Therefore, you wouldn't have to be looking at the people in the grand mansions because you would actually be focused on the people who are having to pay and struggle to pay their rent every single day, Mr Finlay. So a few years ago, most food bank visitors were homeless folk living on the street. Now, the larger number of clients and families are a parent, have a parent working. What does that tell us about inequality? In the 21st century, in one of the richest countries in the Western world, the gap between the rich and the poor is widening dramatically. This Scottish Government has made advances, but is effectively powerless to make any big changes without further devolved powers. And I'd really love to have the same crystal ball that Ken McIntosh has got, because obviously he knows what's in the Smith report. But this has to change. On Thursday, we will see the Smith report. Maybe he's going to tell us where he got his crystal ball. Ken McIntosh. Ms McKelvey, because the Minister seems to be suggesting that tax powers are not coming to this Parliament. Does Ms McKelvey believe that's the case? Christina McKelvey. Uh, Ms McKelvey will not be um, putting any uh, focus on any Smith Commission unless it actually delivers the vow, which I very much doubt it will. This is the UK Government's chance to live up to their word. This is the Labour Party's chance to live up to their vow, to deliver on the powers that were promised in the final days of the referendum and translate these proposals into real action. In this Scottish Government, we believe that equality and cohesion are good for growth as well as good for individuals. And, they will, and the Scottish Government will do all it can within its powers to tackle that inequality. And we heard some of those measures today. Of course, inequality is about a great deal more than the money in people's pockets. Health, education, gender, race, skills training, job choices and access to services are all significant issues in this crucial balancing act. Seeking an equal, fair and prosperous economy demands, I think, two fundamentals. One, recognition that a strong economy is both the driver of and the follower of a fair and equal society. And two, the government has the power, the vision and the commitment to build genuine equality for all. This government has everything except enough power to bring about structural change. We pay the living wage to all of our public service staff and we need to control the minimum wage. We need to end zero hours contracts and we need to end the unfair umbrella scams in our construction industry. Unlike Westminster, we have given our NHS staff all but a modest pay rise. Scotland has the highest employment rate, the lowest unemployment and inactivity rates of all four UK nations. But we have a London government, backed in full last week by the Labour Party, bringing about another £6 billion of cuts on top of those already in place. You don't create a more prosperous economy and a fairer society by ensuring that the most vulnerable and the needy are the ones who are pushed further away. If you hold young mothers back from returning to work because childcare costs are too high, you don't improve the economy. You hold it back. And you hold back that woman's own prosperity and you hold back that result on her family too. Female employment in Scotland has reached its highest level in record, rising to 1.3 million, up 46,000 in the last year. Provide, as this Scottish Government that does in doing in a decent free childcare facility and you bring women back into the workforce, that in turn creates more wealth, better tax revenues and a healthier economy. Building equality won't be an overnight job. We all need to be engaged, not just the government. This is a crucial role for all of the organisations we've heard of. NHS Scotland, Oxfam, SCVO and CRER and all the civil society as well. I would love to be able to be a part in do doing just what Oxfam have asked for and even it up global report. I know full well that many of my colleagues across this chamber and the Scottish Government would love to do the same too. But we are denied the powers in this place to allow us to move forward substantially with our ideals and vision. What we can do within our powers and what we are granted to do within our powers. Last week, the Scottish Government and the STUC committed to closer working to achieve their shared vision in a wealthier and more equal society for Scotland. The establishment of a Fair Work Convention would further enhance the way government employers, trade unions, employees engage to embed progressive workplace practices. And I would ask the ministers to take a close look at the umbrella scam issue. Channel 4 dispatches last night did a piece on it and cut out some of it, but hopefully we can gather some of that evidence in the process. That's something that Graeme Smith and the SUC General Secretary has welcomed, saying, and I quote, 
This stands in sharp contrast, sharp contrast to the outdated approach from the Government at Westminster, which does not recognise the positive contribution that trade unions bring to society and the importance of fair work in achieving key and economic social objectives. And I would say again to Mr Finlay, where what any trade union legislation did Tony Blair overturn in his time in government? None. So we share the desire for a better Scotland and we will make it happen. Thank you very much. Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Bob Doris. Officer, since this parliament was established in 1999, I believe we have proven collectively that we are at our very best when tackling head-on the inequalities which scar our nation. From breaking new ground with land reform to confronting all prejudices like homophobia and bigotry, challenging the stigma around mental health, speaking out against female genital mutilation, standing up to traffickers and those who exploit migrants, exposing the conditions in which too many gypsy travellers are forced to live, and giving a platform to carers, to young people, to pensioners, to the disadvantaged and the underrepresented. This young parliament can mature and has matured by addressing the inequalities which aff afflict Scotland, no matter how challenging, by fostering genuine equality and diversity, and by championing the human rights written into our foundation statute. We have challenged some of, our most pernicious, some of the most pernicious, the most complex, and often the most sensitive of social inequalities. Where necessary, Many of us will even have challenged ourselves and our own assumptions about equality, and we will have challenged our Scottish Government too in pursuit of a fairer Scotland. That's fair. That's what the Parliament of a compassionate, socially progressive country must do. Where we find injustice, we have to confront it. In a briefing to members, Oxfam have shone a light on some of those injustices. Citing the Scottish Government, they say that the richest 10% of the households, it says before in Scotland, have 900 times the accumulated wealth of the poorest. Odd Scotland say that the average health life expectancy of people living in the least deprived areas in Scotland is around 18 years higher than people living in the most deprived areas. More than half of the lowest achieving S4 pupils in Scotland's secondary schools came from the three most deprived income de uh, decline, de de deciles. I would appeal for all of us to confront those economic inequalities, health inequalities, educational inequalities and the issues of social justice we are debating today with the same rigour we have applied to our equal opportunities in social affairs. We cannot pull our punches in the fight against inequality and it is for that reason I intend to support the Labour Amendment. Presiding officer, we must do all we can, using every means at our disposal, to narrow the gap and fashion a fairer, more equal society. Like the Scottish Government, I believe the coalition's economic and social policies are failing. After the slowest recovery in 100 years, Scotland and the UK are still struggling with a cost of living crisis and rising inequality. There is an alternative. We can build a higher wage, better skilled economy that is supported by good public services and rich with opportunities, not just for some, but for all. We all have to play our part. We in this parliament are not just bystanders. We have a duty to find solutions, not just excuses. Most of us across this chamber agree that the national minimum wage successfully set a floor below which wages were not allowed to fall tackling the worst of poverty pay and reducing wage inequality. Most of us also agree that the living wage would reduce in-work poverty, improve employee retention and wellbeing, and could even improve productivity in the workplaces of the living wage employers. The Scottish Government have previously explained their hesitancy to legislate as a way of guaranteeing that the public sector uses its purchasing power to secure the living wage from contractors. However, they have not given a good reason as to why they refused to accept constructive non-legislative proposals from my Labour colleagues last year for a national living wage strategy and a Scottish living wage unit. We must do more to promote the living wage for the sake of those struggling to get by. Presiding officer, I also want to highlight the case for early intervention and preventative spending. Many of us will know about the work of experts in this field the Violence Reduction Unit, Suzanne Zedek and the Sir Harry Burns. We could close the life expectancy gap and the attainment gap by addressing the social detriments of, of inequalities. 
intensifying our focus on the early years, tackling insecurity in people's lives, building a sense of coherence and community. In their spending review in 2011, the Scottish Government committed themselves to a decisive shift towards preventative spending. I was a member of the Finance Committee at that time. Yet, in their latest report on the draft budget, the Finance Committee say there is little evidence of the essential shift in resources taking place to support a preventative approach. It is a view also endorsed by Audit Scotland. To address inequalities which hold Scotland back, the Scottish Government must embrace, embrace the practice and not simply the theory of preventative spending. And finally, President Officer, I have, as I have said, this Parliament is at its best when unashamed, unashamed, unashamedly confronting the inequalities which hold Scotland back. We should be offended by injustice and we should be, by, we should be frustrated with inaction. And it is for that reason that I would call on the Scottish Government to strengthen its commitment to both the living wage and early intervention. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Bob Doris to be followed by Christine Graham. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to begin by giving reference to the recent Health and Sport Committee report on health inequalities. A key thread running through that report is the link to economic inequalities. Whether it is poor quality or low paid or temporary work, the committee was clear that income inequality and poverty directly links to significant health inequalities going through life. I am pleased, therefore, that this motion on tackling inequalities gets to the root causes of the fundamental health inequalities that our country suffers from. This debate, therefore, is not just about the money in the pockets of Scotland's workers and families. That is important. It is not just about the patterns of work which can affect the quality of our lives and disempower some of our most vulnerable communities. It is actually also about ensuring that our poorest in society live longer than they are right now, that they are healthier, that they are happier and they feel more secure and empowered than they are right now. And hopefully the longevity of their lives increases beyond what it currently is. That is a huge obligation on everyone in this Parliament. That is the challenge in the motion before us, if that was to be successful. It does not mention health in that motion, but every successful action within that motion will have positive health consequences for the most vulnerable society that we all represent. On that front, I am very pleased to see an independent adviser on poverty and inequality is to be appointed by the Scottish Government, and that there is to be a poverty impact assessment on future Scottish Government legislation. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could give cognizance of health inequalities as part of the remit of that independent adviser, though I do accept by the nature of its independence, you want to be careful about how prescriptive you are within that remit. And also in terms of the uh, impact assessments, given cognizance in relation to health would be very useful to hear more information on that. We heard earlier in the debate the statistic that 59 per cent of children in poverty stay in a household where only one adult is in employment. In 2009-2010, it was 43 per cent. The fact that things are getting dramatically worse is an absolute disgrace. It needs to be challenged. And two of the most obvious actions, there are, except there are others, but two of the most obvious actions to tackle this disgrace are actions around the minimum living wage and, secondly, actions around the tax credit system. I would note in relation to the tax credit system that recent reforms have put 100,000 households further into poverty, 88 per cent of those households containing children. Now, presiding officer, this parliament has no control over the minimum wage. We have no control over the tax credit system. In the parts of the living wage where we do have control over all the Scottish Government's pay policies, we implement a living wage as standard. I do not want to get drawn into the debate with Labour over whether there is legal or other. excuse me one second, let me develop my point, please. I just don't want to get drawn into debate with Labour about Labour saying, well, you have the power now to enforce the minimum wage else, sorry, the living wage elsewhere. This is not a bun fight. If the Scottish Government thought they could do it, they would do it. 
They have made that clear. Let us not do petty political point scoring over this. Let us work together to improve the income of our most vulnerable people within society. Now, in terms of what we can do and what we can do together, I have to say that it would be for Labour to justify why some of these powers that I would like to see improve and enhance those who are blighted by poverty is not coming to this place. But in terms of the powers that we do have in this place, how can we promote a living wage? And of course, we've heard about the Poverty Alliance's living wage accreditation scheme and the Scottish business... Um, I, I, sorry, Duncan, I should really... Yes, yeah. Margaret McCulloch. Do you not think that if the government actually backed and supported the Scottish living wage unit and give it its support, then it would encourage employers to actually introduce the living wage? Bob Doris. Well, I, I don't see how you can do any more than encouraging employers to deliver on the living wage by empowering the Poverty Alliance to go about the business who have recently just signed up the 100th employer to deliver on a living wage. So I think there's a little bit of the party politics coming in there. If it was a good thing, we would do it. We don't care whose idea it was, can I say to Labour. We would do it. It's the right thing to do. Here are a couple of ideas. I'm very proud of the small business bonus scheme that we have in Scotland, promoting many, uh, supporting many small businesses. Uh, not all of them, of course, will pay the living wage. I would like to think we can use the small business bonus scheme where possible to incentivise them towards paying a living wage. It's a blunt instrument. There could be unintended consequences. But I see Labour cheering at that. It's a blunt instrument. There could be unintended consequences with it. But it is worth exploring again where we can. Likewise, the use of apprenticeships within Scotland. I don't think that every employer can just pay the living wage overnight. But I think most of our employers, where they can, should have a strategy to move towards paying the living wage. And there's where we've got a route of travel where we can all be in that together. Let me finish off by saying another key part of the Health and Sport Committee report was in relation to the health consequences of the £6 billion welfare reform that is befalling Scotland. And I have to finish, as I started, by saying we will do all we can in this Parliament to mitigate the worst aspects of inequalities, but the root powers and the root causes to deal with that sit in another place. That's not to let the Scottish Government off the hook. We must work together in partnership, but let's not kid ourselves on. Close, the real leaders of power, they sit elsewhere. Many thanks. Christine Graham to be followed by Duncan McNeill. Thank you, Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. Building a fairer Scotland and tackling inequalities, of course we can all sign up to that and absolutely support a living wage. Together with the importance of work, not only because of the financial security and worth it brings an individual, but for a healthy physical, mental and indeed social life. And I want to quote, however, from Scottish Justice Matters of June 2014, and it touches on some of the issues raised by Bob Doris and by others in this Parliament. I'm looking at Duncan McNeill over a very long period of time. People who come to the attention of the criminal justice system in Scotland are drawn predominantly from communities that experience poor physical and mental health, often associated with a lifetime of social exclusion, lack of employment, hope, purpose and their consequences. And I say to Bob Doris, one of the depressing things about being in here 15 years is that we've been talking about the inequalities in health for a very, very long time, no matter who is in government. I recall when chairing Health and Sport Committee, Harry Burns, the former Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, telling us inequality, in fact, begins in the womb. The mother may have a poor diet, she may be a smoker, an alcoholic or addict. Tragically, babies have been born with fetal alcohol syndrome and with withdrawal, other withdrawal symptoms. And I remember a long campaign with Duncan McNeill about the drug dependency of families and tackling that because of the impact on the children. So, regrettably, sometimes getting societal change through politics is almost like turning around that proverbial oil tanker. So these inequalities which begin in birth continue till death. We know that in the poorest areas of Glasgow, that death is premature compared to the national average. So I want to focus on that area I've touched on where actually, ironically, inequality is a plus. And that's if you want a cr criminal career and become a guest of Her Majesty's prison. 
You take the contribution of addictions to being incarcerated, many prisoners across from the young offenders through the women's uh, institutions across to the adult prisons have a long history of drug and alcohol abuse. Many too, as a consequence, or indeed separately from that, have mental health problems, often which have led them directly to committing offences. These are sad circumstances for individuals, but even more depressing, these problems permeate through the family, sometimes through generations, sometimes through the extended family, and to the community beyond. These families and communities, as referred to in this article, are very often in very deprived areas of no or low employment or indeed no expectation of employment. Now, once in prison, though we have long since moved from prisons being merely places of punishment with turnkeys, more places where freedom is deprived but we hope to rehabilitate, and prison officers play a substantial role in that rehabilitation process, nevertheless, recidivism the revolving door continues. Now, big moves have now been made to ensure that through care starts in the prison and continues outside it, because sometimes the worst time for a prisoner is the sixth, maybe the day they come out of the prison, but sometimes six to eight weeks, sometimes a few years afterwards, if they're not supported, particularly in the community, which may in fact be drawing them back into a lifestyle that took them into prison in the first place. Now, although the SPS is endeavouring to turn these lives around, you've got to realise that some 60% of prisoners have difficulties with literacy, a very basic thing of reading and writing, and some with numeracy as well. So the challenge to society across all portfolios, across all politics, is really momentous. In prison, they're discharged, and despite improvements in through care, as I said, they're back into communities where there are, they carry these huge inequalities of their childhood, of their health, of their education, of basic skills, back with them as a burden, and back into a challenging situation which we would find difficult to face. It's a tough call to sort these inequalities out. As for employment, there are a few good employers who proactively take on ex-prisoners to give them a chance, but many, many will not take that. So that's a further inequality. And I take you back to where that inequality started. So I was glad that this debate has expanded beyond a living wage to look at really the root causes that take us right back. That's important, but the root cases, causes of inequality and how it crosses from health to justice to education and perhaps that all crashes together in the catastrophe of some people being in prison. So we need to deal with those fundamental inequalities. And the only thing I would say to the Chamber is this, because I know some people have only been here three years, some have been eight. Please, please, let's not just be discussing these another four or five years down the line because they are, there are solutions out there. They're not party political, but we have to grasp, perhaps for a start, getting the public at large to see that some people that we have in prison are victims. Of course, they may have earned and lost the right to have the freedom of movement, but they have come there for a reason. And some of that reason is why our society has let them down. Thank you very much. And I now call Duncan McNeill to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> and yet again, another Tuesday, and I find myself in the, uh, speaking today in the Chamber on a topic where there is probably more to unite us than there is to divide us. Although, you know, as usual, it's set up, and anybody that was passing or anybody who's sitting in these galleries would, wouldn't think there was any agreement at all at times here today. Um, but we're dealing with an issue that does engender frustration and anger. Uh, as an MSP representing a constituency where nearly a fifth of people are income deprived, where mortality rates from all causes are higher than the national average, they have every right to be angry and frustrated. But we owe those people more than anger. We need to be honest and accept as others have said, and Christine's just said, that we're dealing with a wide issue that cuts right across government and society, which is complex, difficult, requires commitment, and, of course, hard 
political decisions. This is not just an issue that divides the super rich from the super poor, but it also divides those on no pay and low pay, male, female, old, young, able, disabled. Moreover, it's not just an issue that can be attributed to any one moment in history or one government or one party or even in this moment of crisis, austerity. We should do well to remember the words of Campbell Christie when he was asked to look at this and refer to last week's debate, and he referred to in last week's debate, alongside a decade of growth in public spending, inequalities grew too. So even when we had the money, did we spend it wisely? Despite significant investment, we've seen in work poverty rising, educational attainment falling, and a widening health gap between different parts of the country. And of course, the allegation of finance is important in tackling inequalities, but money on its own can't solve the problem. We have to ensure that we have the right policies in place and a determination to see them through. And while we focus on that growing number of people who now find themselves in work, on benefits and in poverty, do we really believe that cuts in the bus operator's grant with pushed up fares didn't affect that working poor? Do we really appreciate the decisions we took on cutting the housing budget wouldn't put up rents of the working poor? Do we think that cutting local government spending, did we think that that wouldn't push up the cost of childcare? All of these actions that we bear responsibility for impacted negatively, disproportionately, on the working poor. So we need to be clear about the objectives that we're trying to achieve. We've got to do better. The left hand needs to know what the right hand's doing. And we need to, if we really want to tackle this. And the other, the other thing I want to touch on here today is that we need, to, we need to be honest and not to pretend that this argument is won. That all we need is more money and new powers. Harry Burns has been mentioned a couple of times today. And he said, part of the challenge is not just about pulling a set of policy levers, but creating a sense of community and compassion. He listened, he said, to Amartya Sen, a Nobel Prize winning economist, giving a lecture uh, at the time and, and about poverty. And he said, poverty and the tolerance of the intolerable. His analysis as to why societies such as, where he was talking about India, tolerate extremes of poverty is not that there's nothing they can do about it. There is plenty they could do about it. Nor not that they do not care about it, but the middle classes don't understand how destructive poverty is. They think we live with people, we know they're poor, but they get free schools, they get free meals, they get free health services. That kind of thing can't all be bad. They also quoted Jerry Hassan in his new book, where he argued that the problem is lack of empathy and connectedness. Indeed, the Glasgow Centre for Population of Health Comparative Analysis uh, health comparative analysis of Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester shows that although the three cities are the same in terms of inequality and average income, they differ significantly in the causes of premature death and that the set of indicators that are completely different between the three cities are related to empathy and connect connectiveness. There, we haven't won the argument when I see the type of language and aspiration presented in manifestos at the, the, the elections we stand at, and we win the argument for that, then, then we can get on our high horse in these chambers and say this is what we need to deliver. 
But as well as our aspiration in these chambers, we need to win the argument. The argument has not been won. There is no th that clear um, a commitment to empathy and connectiveness in our society. And we will, when we win that, then it will be up to us politicians to deliver a fairer Scotland that our society deserves. Thank you. I now call Kevin Stewart to be followed by Nigel Doyle. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, analysis by the Equality Trust shows that the UK is the fourth most unequal country in the OECD. And overall, the number of people living in relative poverty, poverty in our country uh, rose to 1 million in 2012 13. And we know that many of the families that are struggling to get by have family members in work. 59% of children who live in poverty live in households with at least one adult in employment. 71,428 people, including 22,387 children, received a three-day supply of emergency food from Trussell Trust food banks in Scotland uh, between April 2013 and March 2014. And the figures which have just been released for December show that 10,489 folk were helped by Trussell Trust in Scotland, the highest number on record, and one third of those were children. I think that is absolutely shocking. Uh, and these kind of things show quite clearly that the austerity policies uh, of the Tory Liberal government, uh, which have also been adopted by Labour, are failing Scotland and are failing the people of Scotland. And what we hear um, from certain folks is, oh, well, we've done this, and this, is, this may work. And we heard it from Mr Rennie today uh, in terms of personal uh, allowances. Uh, and I think that Mr Rennie uh, would be wise to listen to some of the experts and what they think uh, the raising of personal tax allowances uh, has actually done. Because they think it's benefited the rich more than it has the poor. Julia Unwin, chief executive of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, has said, raising the personal tax allowance is an expensive way of helping the working poor. Most of the additional money will actually go to better off families, while poorer families only keep a third of the tax cut. The IPPR state that the poorest households gain less from this change and households in almost all sections of the income distribution will see a greater amount taken away through the 1% cap on benefits upgrading that is handed to them via personal tax reforms. And it goes on. The IFS state that the people that will gain most from rises in the personal allowance are those in the upper middle of the overall income distribution. These are the facts. This is not redistribution. This is not progressive, um, as uh, Mr Rennie would have you say. And it is a case of Mr Rennie getting in his excuses for backing the austerity policies of the Tories. And in that, uh, I'll take Mr Johnson so he can defend Mr Rennie uh, or not, as the case may be. Uh, Alex the, Johnston. Is the member aware that the increase in the basic rate tax threshold was entirely financed by reducing the upper rate tax threshold. So as a consequence, the total amount of tax stayed the same. It's just that the poor paid less of it. Um, oh, I, 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 this is not what uh, Joseph Rowntree are saying, or what the IPPR are saying, or the IFS are saying. Now, what I would say to Mr Johnson in response to him, what we have seen uh, is a form of regressive taxation in terms of the cut from 50% to 45% uh, for the richer in society. Something uh, that he obviously wants to see, something which I don't think was right. And we hear from the Labour Party um, about taxing uh, richer folk in society. What they forget is for most of their time in government, the highest ta ba tax ban was 40%. Not even the 45% it is now, but 40%. Hard, in my opinion, that is not uh, progressive uh, taxation. Uh, and I, 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 I would want to see Mr Finlay rise to defend that, if he possibly would. Neil Finlay. 
Uh, well, Mr Stewart, um, I wonder if you could advise us whether you support the 50p tax rate that Labour is going to impose or wh which level of taxation would you set? Tell us what I can tell you now, Mr Finney, if I'd been in uh, the House of Commons at the time of that uh, vote on the reduction of 50 to 45 per cent, I would have voted to retain 50 per cent. And I'll tell you something else I wouldn't have done. I Mr. wouldn't have Finley, entered, the, entered the lobbies. I wouldn't have entered the lobbies, presiding officer, with the Labour Party last week joining the Tories to vote for more austerity. And the thing is, the thing is that Mr, Red, uh, Mr. Finney's uh, running mate uh, and Mr Finney, Finley's running mate, sorry, in the uh, leadership elections, Katie Clark, at least she had the sense uh, to vote with the SNP um, and Plaid Cymru and the Greens, the more progressive parties, against austerity. And she asked during the course of the campaign, which side are you on? An end to austerity versus no clear plan to tackle rising inequality, which was obviously an attack on the Blairite Murphy um, because uh, we have seen her go against everything uh, that that Blairite has done since. It is about time that the Labour Party were truly honest with the people of this country about what they are about. Because no longer are they socialists. They never have been for a long while. You're led by a Blairite here in Scotland and you'll gladly walk through the lobbies with the Tories to vote for more austerity and are likely to vote for Trident renewal Major today. Joshua, Be honest with the Scottish public. Many thanks. Now call on Nigel Dawn to be followed by Margaret McDougall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I start from the position that inequalities actually affect us all. And I also start from the position that I feel as though we discussed most of this last week at John Mason's members' debate. Uh, and apart from Neil Findlay, I think I was the only one, the one here who contributed to that debate. So I think we could largely rerun it. And I'll be asking the Labour Party a couple of questions which they weren't able to answer at the time. Um, I note that the spirit level has already been mentioned, uh, and I'm delighted that it was. I, I note that it even made it into some of my other reading, because I do like to make sure I know that the other parties are thinking occasionally. This is, of course, the red paper on Scotland. Um, we'll see where that takes the Labour Party, but they do seem to have registered that inequalities affect us all, they're bad for us all, and they affect every area of life. Now, what I'd like to do is to take Kim McIntosh in particular back to a debate that we had last November, because, again, he's also mentioned the Oxfam report on extreme inequalities around the world. And it does seem to me that if you think about the extremes, even if we don't actually have them here, then you may learn something about what's going on and be able to derive something from it. Now, one of the fundamental lessons that I think Oxfam alluded was that extreme inequalities actually generate their own barriers. If you are sufficiently poor, there is no prospect that you will actually put together the wherewithal to give you or your family the education that gives you the opportunity to get out of poverty. So there is a level at which below which there is simply no escape. Martin Tosh. Welcome to the, the uh, member's point. And uh, I recognise part of what you're saying, that, that certainly that uh, socio-economic deprivation does create extreme barriers. Can I just question the first assertion he made that extreme inequalities do not exist in Scotland? Can I ask him just for, for example, what is, what is his view about the fact that less than 500 people own more than half of the land in Scotland? Let, let, Nigel Dunn. Uh, uh, f forgive me. Let, me. let me go back. I was talking about extreme poverty. I may not have put it correctly. That's an, it's an issue. Uh, sorry, the land, land is an issue we'll come back to another day. Otherwise, we'll never make any progress, but I'm with you. I think the point is that the levels of poverty that you would see in some of the third world countries are manifestly worse than anything you will actually see in Scotland. Now, let's not fool ourselves. Now, what I'd like to go from that point towards is where Alex Johnson came in. Because he told me, I think I was brought up with this idea, that Tory uh, approach is that everybody should have an equal opportunity. And I think he missed the point, which others have made, that actually that opportunity is defined in the womb. That actually your opportunity depends on the family in which you are going to be brought up, to some extent the genetics with which you are going to be brought up. And the same opportunity outside 
is irrelevant if you've actually had inbuilt in opportunities created for you. Now, that I think is where I and Tories are going to disagree. Because what the Tories will tell me, and it's a, it's a thought, it's a thought process, that if everybody's given the same theoretical opportunities out here, then they're all equally available. And the reality is that poverty is its own barrier, which is why I started there. And whilst we're not talking about some of the enormous inequalities that we might see, and extreme poverty we might see elsewhere, we can find down our street, and I can in my constituency, and I bet everybody else can in their constituency, find people whose lack of income completely prevents them from taking some of the opportunities that Tories and others will insist on telling them are there. Now, that is the point that I really think we should be starting from. We need to understand that until we address the circumstances under which a child is born, then we're not going to make any serious inroads into reducing the inequalities which are then a manifest in our society. Now, I'm saying that because I think it's important that we say it. The government knows that. I'm looking at Alex Neal as I say it, and he knows fine well that that's the situation, and I know the government is working on that. Okay? But I'll come back again... My script is going to be completely ignored here because Ken McIntosh at one point said that he was concerned that health policy wouldn't address health inequalities. I think that's roughly what you were talking about. But of course you won't address health inequalities by health policy if that child has started in such poverty that those health inequalities, those health problems are actually inbuilt and they're not going to be addressed in the early years of life because of the parental situation and the poverty in which the child is being brought up. So actually, we can do nothing about the genetics, of course, of childbirth. We're only going to get anywhere near this if we get back to the absolute fundamental, which is pretty much the day the child is born, or come to think of it, the day the mother expects to be bringing the child into the world because one of the first things we know is that the child should be breastfed. Okay. We actually have to go back to time Mr. before the last child is born to get this right. I, I, well, I'll, yeah, just Thank you, the member. Would the member agree? That, again, that's not entirely true. In, in the recent years, and this is the trouble about widening inequality, the uh, life expectancy of the most prosperous women in Scotland uh, is, is, has expanded. In other words, the least, the least prosperous women in Scotland are now dying sooner than they are than the, the most prosperous. And that is in the last few years alone, the last 10 years. In your remaining 20 seconds, please, well, Mr. Thank Dodd. you, Presiding Officer. I wasn't even expecting 30 seconds. I will stick to my fundamental point, which is that a child's expectations and prospects in life are defined, firstly, by where and when they are born and who to, but secondly, actually, to the educational position and social status of their parents. And unless we do everything to improve that, we're not actually going to crack this. Many thanks. And I now call on Margaret McDougall to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Tackling inequalities is a huge topic, including health barriers to work, childcare, digital exclusion, education, housing and welfare, to name but a few. I am going to focus my speech on health inequalities across Scotland and because it is a particular issue in North Ayrshire which I represent and where I live. Health inequality in Scotland is a complex and growing issue. For example, life expectancy in the most deprived areas in Scotland is 70.1 years for men. Would you just let me get started? Uh, thank you. And 76.8 for women, while in the most affluent areas, this figure stands at 8.24 for men and 84.8 for women. In North Ayrshire, the difference between the most deprived area, Fullerton and Irvine, and the most affluent area, Whitehurst Park and Cowinning, is stark at 24.7 years. The geographic difference between Whitehurst Park and Fullerton is roughly five miles, yet the difference in life expectancy is almost 25 years. I'm sure everyone in the chamber will agree that this is shocking and that the situation is totally unacceptable. The reasons for this difference are, of course, down to many factors, such as levels of poverty, 
unemployment and individuals' socio-economic status. And I'll take that intervention now. Pet Brody. Mr Brody. In terms of socio-economic status, uh, Labour MPs voted for a welfare cap just last week uh, that locked in the Tory cuts that we know will push 100,000 children into poverty by 2020. How do you think that will affect health inequalities? I mean, you keep talking about what Labour did last week and uh, we are talking about what's happening today here in Scotland, the inequalities, and what's, what Labour did down in the Westminster. We're talking about what we are doing in Scotland. According to the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland briefing, those who live in deprived areas have higher rates of heart disease, obesity, diabetes, and problems with drugs and alcohol abuse. So it's clear that health inequalities do not stand alone. They are caused in part by the social economic inequalities that exist within our society. And in my view, the it front is, bench could exchange it, their views and debate. Thank you. Thank you, presiding officer. And in my view, it is our job as elected representatives to eradicate the inequalities that exist within Scotland. This is an issue of human rights and human dignity. To do this, we need better collaboration between services in the public and third sectors, promotion of early years intervention and preventing measures, as well as adopting evidence-based decision-making. Health professionals, councils, community planning partnerships, the third sector, and both the Scottish and UK governments must work together to effectively tackle these issues. And an integrated approach is vital to success. In this respect, I welcome the Early Years Collaborative, which is a coalition of community planning partners aiming to deliver tangible improvement in outcomes and reduce inequalities for Scotland's vulnerable children and shift the public services towards early intervention and prevention by 2016. So can the Cabinet Secretary, in his summing up today, update Parliament on the progress of this initiative and the difference it is making at grassroots levels. Adopting early years approaches and taking preventative measures can, according to NHS Scotland, be a cost-effective way of tackling the economic, social and environmental causes of health inequalities. And it's better at reducing these inequalities than downstream measures such as treating illness. So adopting holistic, person-centred approaches is key to changing behaviours, which in turn reduces health inequalities. Finally, presiding officer, we need an evidence-based policy, for example, the recent NHS Scotland report, informing investment to reduce health inequalities in Scotland, found that the introduction of the living wage, which the Scottish Government blocked from being delivered through the Procurement Reform Bill, generated the largest beneficial impact on health, as well as a most a modest reduction in health inequalities. To conclude, we can't treat health inequalities as a standalone issue. It is complex, as we've heard from many speakers today, and ties into employment, poverty levels and socio-economic background, as well as other individual factors. To tackle it, we need collaboration between all services, a focus on early intervention, prevention and changing behaviours. We need to ensure the most deprived areas in our societies get the support they need through a commitment to the living wage to start closing the gap between the richest and the poorest in Scotland. The Scottish Government could do so much more with the powers it already has not to mention the ones they are going to get with the Smith Agreement. It's time to step up to the plate and be serious about eradicating inequality in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Now call on George Adam to be followed by Roderick Campbell.
Thank you, President Officer. Uh, representing my own constituency, I am only too aware of the inequality that is there. And like many, I believe that the equality uh, and the cohesion are the good for growth as well as good for the individuals and their families. It is therefore welcome that the Scottish Government's programme for government focuses strongly on a stronger economy and a fairer society. This has been welcomed by most of Civic Scotland and business organisations, and it is important that we actually keep that balance. It's also to, to ensure that we do have that stronger, fairer economy and society. But currently, as many of my colleagues have already mentioned, we don't live in that fair society. Because, as already has been mentioned, the wealthiest 1 per cent will soon own more than the rest of the world's population, according to a study by anti-poverty charity Oxfam. And as already been mentioned, Oxfam say it expects the wealthiest 1 per cent to own 50 per cent of the world's wealth by 2016. In fact, Kevin Stewart met, and I think uh, Mr McIntosh mentioned the uh, Oxfam seven-point plan on uh, inequality. Now, if you look at that seven-point plan, there is actually only one of which of the seven points that the Scottish Government currently has power to do anything over. If you look at the rest of them, the other six are entirely at the behest of Westminster. And that is the issue that we are dealing with at the moment here as well. But, you know, yes, no problem, Mr McIntosh. Ken McIntosh. Can, can I just miss, ask Mr Adam, because it's a question that Mr McDonald and Mr Don also raised. Are there any actions the Scottish Government can take which will have an impact on reducing in inequality? Are there any at all? That's a Adam. question, Mr McIntosh. The government's already got a whole host of uh, initiatives that they're taking going. The problem is the limitations within the devolved settlement. That is the problem. And as we look at what uh, comes from the Smith Commission, we have to ensure that this uh, government actually gets the powers it needs to make that full difference. But as I already said, out of these seven points that Oxfam mentioned, only one is within the power of this government here in Scotland. But how can we continue this to happen? You know, presiding officer, it's no coincidence that the UK GAB cabinet is full of millionaires. We have a Prime Minister and a Chancellor, both with personal fortunes of around £4 million. However, they are driving forward policies targeting the worst off in society. I would challenge any one of the UK government to live in my constituency, receiving only hardship payments after being sanctioned and relying on food banks. And I wonder how long they would think about their current reforms in welfare. They would be looking at it from an entirely different scenario. But most people are not in benefits or living in poverty through choice, just as Mr Cameron and Mr Osborne were not born into privilege by choice. In Scotland, we believe in the Girfeck principle, getting it right for every child, no matter where you are born in Scotland, you should have the same chances to succeed in life. And this brings up to what my colleague Mr Don was bringing up earlier on as well, and providing the support and opportunity throughout that life uh, to ensure that they can achieve all that they can. But the Scottish Government has currently achieved so much. You know, the Opportunities for All initiative will continue to guarantee young people between the ages of 16 and 19 a training or education opportunity. The SNP government was first in Scotland to take this action. And also the Scottish Government will continue to deliver 25,000 modern apprenticeships per year. Fee-free higher education for Scottish students ensures that access to university education is not based on the ability to pay, but on the ability to learn. And meanwhile, students in England pay fees of up to £9,000 per year. We are protecting education maintenance allowance for 16 to 19 year olds and we'll provide, the Scottish Government is providing record funding to support paid to college students. We are working towards a minimum income of £7,000 for most vulnerable university students. So this shows that the Scottish Government has done what it can to help on the side of education. But Westminster austerity is making things worse in Scotland. According to the analysis of the Equality Trust, the UK is the most fourth most unequal country in the OECD. The Child Poverty Action Group has estimated that Scotland's poverty rate will increase by 100,000 by 2020 as a direct result of UK government's tax and benefit policies. And these are the issues that we have to deal with because these are the issues that our constituents expect us to deal with. 
But one of the other things, families who have access to benefits are only too aware that the dark austerity clouds of the Westminster establishment are there. Only last week, the Labour Party backed their friends in the Conservative Party on austerity. People in Scotland are now aware of the political games that Labour and Conservatives play while they're in Westminster. But families in Scotland will be hit by a £6 billion benefit cut in five years to 2015-16, with nearly 70 per cent of well care cuts to Scotland still expected, still to come. So we've not had the, the end of it yet. The Scottish Government can mitigate and does mitigate when it can. But why should we be in a situation where the Scottish Government has to fix the problems that are created by Westminster. We should be actually working together to ensure that we can deliver for all of our constituents. But as the Labour MPs backed their Tory colleagues in the austerity, they left Scotland behind. They left behind 105,000 disabled people who will lose at least £1,120 per year due to Westminster's welfare cuts. And they left behind the individuals who are moving, moved from DLA to PIP. And uh, the fact that the benefit expenditure of Scotland of this will be around by, uh, cut by around 310 million. They left all these individuals behind, presiding officer. When we are discussing this, we have to ensure that we are looking to the future for our people, for people in Scotland, provide for them, not to sit here and continue to play the typical games that Westminster have played for far too long. But now, thankfully, the public in Scotland have seen wise to this and they're beginning to see that neither of the UK parties have any idea what they will do in the future. Many thanks. I uh, now call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Cara Hilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Ken McIntosh and indeed George Adam have referred to the Oxfam publication on inequality in the world, uh, which the timing of the publication of which has obviously coincided with the uh, economic summit in that uh, model of equality, Davos, Switzerland. But uh, nobody should underestimate the extent of the task in tackling inequality and indeed the difficulties that lie in building a more equal society. Nor, as the Health and Sports Committee report makes clear, should we forget the fact that inequalities in one area of life are likely to be closely connected with inequalities elsewhere. Christine Graham has talked uh, quite interestingly, I thought, about the impact of inequality on the prison system. And similarly, we must recognise that changes in the approach to public spending may exacerbate the problem of inequality. And whilst accepting it may be simplistic to suggest, for example, that the increasing use of food banks is directly connected to welfare reform and the use of sanctions in the welfare system, the very growth of food banks, in my view, at the very least reflects the increasing numbers of people who are simply falling through the net. We've heard much about the growing number of Scottish households either suffering from changes to benefits or benefit sanctions or on low incomes requiring assistance from the Trussell Trust and indeed other food banks. And for the almost 10,500 people who uh, received assistance from the Trussell Trust uh, in December, the phrase, we're all in this together, will have a very hollow ring. Returning to the Health and Sport Committee report, may I commend the committee for its clarity? It begins, of course, by referring to the well-known contrast between life expectancy in Lenzie and Carlton in Glasgow's East End. And it also reminds us that despite devolution, health inequalities remain persistently wide. Like many today, I make reference to the comments of Harry Burns. In particular, his very stark comments that a large part of the population had failed to improve its health at the same rate as the more affluent part of the population. In addition, what I found particularly revealing was the fact that public health campaigns in relation to alcohol, tobacco, diet and exercise had little or no impact on health inequalities. This fact is reinforced by the briefing from Ash Scotland, where they consider the Scottish Household Survey, which indicates that the smoking rate in Scotland's poorest areas was 36%, compared to 10% in the wealthiest communities. And while the rate had dropped generally, the gap between rich and poor had not closed significantly. What this means is that there are disproportionately more deaths from smoking in poorer areas, and of course it cuts the amount of money available to low-income families. If smoking rates were reduced accordingly, spending power and other items would increase. What this information suggests to me is that public health campaigns need to be better focused and we should be prepared to make a disproportionate effort in seeking to reduce that differential. In 2014, it was estimated that 427,000 people earned less than the living wage. That's 18.4% of the workforce. 
It's particularly prevalent for women, with over one in five women earning less than the living wage in 2014, as against 14% of men. That's why the promotion and the continued promotion of the living wage, wage must remain a priority for this government. Health equalities are complex, according to Sir Harry Burns, although there seems to be a general consensus that having a job, preferably one that pays well, having a good income and being well educated all help, and that being poor, unemployed and in bad housing do not. And when we look at the picture in relation to jobs, however, I was struck by the National Statistics publication of July 2014 on poverty and inequality, income inequality in Scotland for 2012-2013, and in particular by the conclusion which many people have referred to already, that 52% of working age adults on low income were living in households where at least one adult was in employment, as were 59% of children. What this indicates is having a job in itself will not cure poverty. As the commentary on page 7 suggests, relative poverty increased in 2012-2013, reflecting a number of changes, quote, such as changes in the labour market and employment patterns, comma, continued welfare reforms such as tightening of eligibility for tax credits for couples in employment and freezing of some elements of benefits and tax credits, increases in the personal tax allowance and decreases in the average income in the latest year. These factors have a varying impact on the rate of poverty, with some, such as increasing the personal tax allowance, mitigating the impact of others. The net effect, however, is an increase in relative poverty. So there we have it. Increasing personal allowance is not quite the big leap forward as suggested by the Lib Dems. It's simply, simply something that lessens the damage. Indeed, as uh, Kevin Stewart's already referred to, many commentators have queried uh, the benefits of the policy. Indeed, in addition, the report makes clear that over the last decade, relative poverty decreased from 20% to 14% in 2011-2012, before rising again. And importantly, the decreases in 2010-11 and 2011-12 were largely attributed to falling median in incomes, rather than any material improvement in people's lives. For children, the picture of a fall in child poverty has been reversed. The number of households with children in employment and in receipt of in working tax credits has fallen as a result of tightened eligibility and conditions under welfare reform. So we're now going backwards. For pensioners, because basic state pension income has increased faster than earnings for working age households and at a faster rate than other benefits and tax credit income, their income has been protected. But overall, their position is largely one of not doing as badly as some. And for the disabled, as Inclusion Scotland's briefing makes clear, that the welfare cuts have had a disproportionate effect on the disabled people in our community. And amidst all this, median household income is declining. So for a small cohort of individuals at the top, things have been getting better. For most others, austerity rules. Clearly, it's better to make progress on inequality when the economy is growing. And in spite of comments to the contrary made by the government, the UK's national debt is growing, with public borrowing growing year on year and successive years of triple-digit billion-pound deficits. Even the Prime Minister is warning of a legacy of debt. I'm certain that will be one of the many epithets about this, his time in office. The solution cannot be simply to cut more public spending, although the Tories and now Labour appear to believe so. We must not embrace austerity. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thanks very much. Now I call on Cara Hilton to be followed by Colin Beattie. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, in Scotland and across the world, inequality is on the up as the gap between rich and poor continues to rise. Oxfam Scotland calculate that the richest three families in Scotland have got the same wealth as the poorest 20% combined. They also say that the richest 10% of families have 900 times more wealth than the poorest 10%. The pay gap is so vast that it would take the average worker 158 years to earn what a FTSE 100 chief executive officer makes in just one year. Yet while those at the top have seen their income and wealth spiral in recent years, the average Scot is working harder than before but still struggling to make ends meet. The Minister referred to the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report which has just come out which reveals that across the UK 8.1 million parents and children are living in incomes below what is needed to cover a minimum household budget. Some of those workers, indeed, are Scottish Government staff, and I would highlight a PCS survey um, that's been emailed to us today that reveals that 40 per cent of PCS members in Scotland do not have enough money to provide for their families. Many Scots are working in two or even three jobs. Thousands of them 
forced to get by on just a min the minimum wage, often no choice but to accept zero hours or short hour contracts, with hours and pay changing from week to week, flexibility dictated by the interests of the employer, very rarely on the needs of the employee, little of any job security, families in both low and average income struggling due to pay freezes, Tory tux cuts to tax credits and welfare, at a time when the cost of living continues to rise, mums forced to turn to pay deal lenders, ending up in a cycle of debt from which there is no escape. Every day, too many families in Scotland and across the UK are making the choice between keeping warm and putting food on the table. A Save the Children survey found that 61 per cent of parents in poverty have cut back on food, with the poorest children missing out on things that other children take for granted, such as a warm winter coat and going on school trips with their classmates. And this is despite the UK being one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Yet one in five of our children grow up in poverty, and many more children live in families that struggle to get by week to week, with Save the Children forecasting that by 2020, a staggering one in three could be in poverty. And the real scandal is that two-thirds of those children in poverty are mums, dads or carers who are in work. In work but in poverty pay, hard-working families who have been pushed further and further into financial difficulty, unable to make ends meet because they are not being paid a living wage. So tackling in-work poverty has got to be an absolute priority. The Scottish Government is doing a lot on this, but they need to do more. And that is why the Scottish Labour Amendment calls for more concerted action to ensure that every single worker in Scotland on a public contract is paid a living wage. It is disappointing that in many areas where the Scottish Parliament has got responsibility, inequality is widening, not closing. And one of the key factors in continuing inequality is our education system, which too often entrenches disadvantage and inequality. I know that across the Chamber we share concerns that too many children's life chances continue to be de determined by the lottery of birth, where they are born and who their parents are, rather than a child's efforts at school or their talents. The gap in attainment levels of children begins from the, between the richest and poorest households in Scotland begins early on in ch a child's life and it continues and widens throughout the school years. It is a gap that persists when our children leave school and move on to the labour market, on to, into college or university, impacting too on earning potential and opportunities in adulthood. By the age of three years old, children from deprived backgrounds are already nine months behind the, in average development and readiness for school. By the age of six, low-achieving children from better-off homes start to outperform those initially higher-achieving children from poorer families. By age 11, one in five children from poorer families are not reading well, compared to one in 10 of all children and to just one in 20 children from the least deprived areas. So growing up in poverty shapes and impacts in every aspect of a child's life. We all know that no child can achieve their full potential when they turn up at school hungry, when they're living in cold, damp, overcrowded housing, when they are stressed and anxious, and when the parents see little escape from the situation. Education should be a route out of poverty. It should enable every single child to reach their potential. But the reality is that for thousands of children in our communities right across Scotland, they continue to be caught up in a cycle of disadvantage from which there is little prospect of escape. And the gap between rich and poor means that rather than unlocking potential, our education system often simply reinforces and reproduces inequality. Our education system simply doesn't work well enough for the most vulnerable children in Scotland, and our attainment gap continues to be wider than in similar countries across the world. I know the Education system, um, Committee are looking at this area, and this is welcome, but it's time for the Scottish Government to do more now with the powers that the Government already has to tackle the deep-rooted inequality in our schools and ensure that no child is left behind. Time to spend less time talking about creating an equal society and more time working to deliver one. The Scottish Parliament already has the power to tackle inequality and I hope that across the political divide we can work to get it right for Scotland's children because that's far more important than scoring political points. There's plenty of good practice out there and I would encourage the Government to look at the steps local authorities like Fife are taking to tackle the cycle of disadvantage. One of the most important ways we can address educational inequality is by ensuring that every single child is reading well. And I would commend the excellent Read On, Get On initiative aimed at ensuring that every child in Scotland is reading well by age 11. I hope this is a campaign that we can all get behind. Ensuring that all children are reading well would be a huge step towards a fairer, more equal Scotland in which no child is left behind, in which every child has the opportunity to support 
to fulfil and to fulfil their potential, ensuring that Scotland really is the best place to grow up for every child. Nelson Mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And those are wise words. But unless we address the inequalities in our education system for too many children and too many of our communities in Scotland, education will continue to close doors rather than open them. Thanks very much. And uh, now Colin, Colin, Be Colin Beattie, uh, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. Presiding officer, in whatever guise it rears its head, inequality is one of the most pressing issues that faces our society today. A report just released yesterday by Oxfam indicates that by 2016, 1% of the world's population will own more wealth than the other 99%. This situation is not only entirely undesirable, but also, frankly, quite unsustainable. I'm sure we'd all agree that strong economies are underpinned by fair, equitable societies, and yet in a global context, we're seeing a continuation of the exact reverse. Oxfam studies show that 3.5 billion people own the same wealth as just 80 people. And as recently as 2010, the comparative figure was 388 people. In a UK context, research by the Equality Trust shows that the richest 100 families have increased their wealth by at least £15 billion since 2008. In the same time frame, the average income rose by a mere £1,233. And in fact, this research shows that the, the current richest 100 families own the same wealth as 30% of UK households, a sure indicate that if any was required, that Westminster's austerity measures are, not doing, are doing nothing but make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Of course, one of the concerns with such inequality is that the rich continue to strengthen their grasp on power while ordinary people are left with a diminished voice. As just one example of methods by which wealth becomes unfairly distributed, the Oxfam report highlights tax avoidance as a major cause for concern. Anders Dahlbeck, a tax policy advisor at ActionAid, estimates that poor nations lose around three times as much to tax havens as they receive in aid. And we in the UK are no strangers to tax avoidance schemes, given the recent headline-grabbing stories featuring pop stars, comedians and huge multinational corporations. Today's debate allows us to highlight the issues surrounding inequality in a, con a Scottish context. And for all its talk of improving the lives of the average hard-working person, Westminster is actually doing the opposite. Indeed, last week's vote to implement £30 billion of cuts clearly displays that the situation is not going to improve any time soon. What has become a feature of our times is the rise of the food banks. The Trussell Trust estimates that 13 million people live below the poverty line a scandalous figure in a country like the UK. In 2013-14, food banks fed 913,138 people across the nation, of which 330,205 were children. And I myself recently took the opportunity to visit the East Lothian Food Bank and see their work firsthand. And I, I applaud the volunteers who staff food banks up and down the country. And I'm sure all of us in the Chamber sincerely appreciate the great work they do. But in this day and age, I believe there should be no need for food banks in the first place. In these trying circumstances, we can see the positive measures the Scottish Government is taking to combat inequality, and as a start, paying the living wage as part of its pay policy shows a clear sign that the Government is fighting the scourge of poverty from the ground up. What better way can there be to help people than by to ensure that they have the money to live a decent quality of life? And I would sincerely hope that many organisations follow the Government's footsteps here, especially given our support to living wage accreditation. In future, we will see every relevant government contract stipulate payment of the living wage as a priority. But let's not forget, too, that the Scottish Government will ensure that NHS staff continue to receive at least a modest pay rise. Compare this to England, where NHS staff have been badly let down by Westminster, and nursing staff in Scotland could be up to £714 better off annually than staff south of the border. I believe it's also necessary to examine where the Scottish Government is providing support in an educational context. We know how important education is in providing our young people the head start in life and ensuring that, whatever their background, they have the same opportunity to make the most of their lives as anyone else. And I need not remind the Chamber that this Government is committed to fee-free high educa higher education in comparison to those who study south of the border with fees of up to £9,000. Surely we would all agree that by placing a price on education, only those who can afford it will benefit, thus perpetuating the cycle of inequality. Ken McIntosh. 
Does Mr Beattie not share my concern that despite the different fee arrangements north and south of the border, that more people from an underprivileged background are able to access higher education in England than they are in Scotland? I, ha I haven't seen figures that actually validate that, and uh, I, I would actually challenge that statement. In separate measures, the Government aims to provide a minimum income of £7,000 to our most vulnerable university students. Westminster has chosen to scrap the education maintenance allowance that provides funding to 16- to 19-year-olds, whereas we, are, we in Scotland have kept this vital source of support. Access to university has been widened under this Government through the access agreements introduced as part of the post-16 education bill. And the results speak for themselves. Our unemployment rate is the lowest of the four UK nations, while our employ employment rate is the highest. Our female employment rate is now at the highest level ever recorded. The council freeze, tax freeze alone will save the average band D taxpayer around £1,682 by 2016-17. Our abolition of prescription charges ensures that more money stays in the pockets of ordinary people compared to those south of the border. And we're committed to providing free personal and nursing care for our old people. And let's not forget our recent implementation of free school meals for all children in primaries one to three. By the end of this year, the UK economy is predicted to be 4% smaller than it was in 2010. And if ever there was a sign the austerity measures aren't working, then this is it. Borrowing in 2015 is expected to be £50 billion higher than was anticipated back in 2010. And this is largely due to real wages being subdued. Presiding officer, I would like to conclude by supporting the SNP government's strong commitment to reducing societal inequality, despite the strength of the opposition we face. And it's true that we will receive new welfare powers as part of the Smith Commission, and I do warmly welcome them. But let's be in no doubt about this. These powers are only going to amount to 15% of the welfare powers available, leaving the vast majority in the hands of Westminster. It appears to me, and I hope to the Scottish people too, that the only solution we have to end the constant undermining of our efforts to reduce inequality and to finally rid ourselves of the damaging austerity, austerity agenda is an SNP vote in the coming general election. Thanks so much. We now move to closing speeches, and I call on Willie Rennie up to seven minutes. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I want to start off with a bit of um, praise for two of the, what I might gently call the old stagers, um, who have been here since 1999. Uh, Duncan McNeill and Christine Graham, who I thought made some, an excellent contribution, both made excellent contributions, thoughtful, quite self-critical of the Parliament and the two governments of which they and we represented, but reflective of the huge challenge um, that we face in trying to tackle inequality, the fact that it's long-standing, the fact that it's embedded, the fact that it has blighted many communities for generations. And I thought their speeches were, a, were great contributions to the debate today. And I also thought Nigel Don and Rhoda Grant's contributions were very good um, as well, reflecting on the, kind of the, the interconnected nature um, of poverty and inequality, the connection which Christine Graham also made between kind of poverty, drink, drugs, prison, that interconnected, that vicious cycle that is very difficult to break. I've only got one slight criticism for Nigel Dawn. I thought he was a little bit tending to the pessimistic. I, I like to believe that we can actually overcome these huge challenges, that even if they have been long-standing problems, I do think we can overcome them. And I always started talking about breastfeeding and so on. Um, but I thought he was tending towards the pessimism. I'm quite happy if Nigel Don wants to, to intervene to perhaps correct my interpretation. Uh, I, I, I'm grateful for the mention in dispatches. Don. Can I say I am completely optimistic about this because I think we know what we need to do. We need the political will to do it. Well, well, I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad because I think it is important that we do have an optimistic view in this parliament that we can overcome these huge challenges. I know we've all got different views about how we can achieve these important challenges, but it is one of the biggest tests for this parliament. And to be frank, so far, the parliament has not really succeeded in making a sufficient enough dent in those uh, challenges. I also was delighted that Margaret McCulloch talked about Suzanne Zedak, who I think actually has got one of the answers, um, which she talks about communities, families, but also attachment theory. The fact that too often, because of the direction of child protection in society, we push children even further away rather than bringing them closer to us to give them the support and the encouragement, that emotional intelligence that they require. Um, she doesn't just believe that it's about improving the quantity of childcare, which she does believe should be 
increased, but she also believes it's the quality of the childcare that we provide as well is essential to make a big difference and break that vicious cycle that Duncan McNeill and Christine Graham eh, talked about. Um, however, there are other contrasts in this debate, and kind of like a stuck record, we go back to the old arguments about um, we can only achieve more things by having more powers in this parliament. And Duncan McNeill was right again when we can't just simply solve this problem by more money, add more powers, but some seem to be stuck within that area. Um, members will remember that I have pointed out in previous debates that despite the rhetoric from the SNP, they were not promising one extra penny to be spent on welfare. In their white paper, they were very clear that they would spend exactly the same as Ian Duncan Smith was planning to spend on welfare in 2016-17. Not one extra penny. And these things are difficult choices. We all understand that they are difficult choices. But the rhetoric needs to match the actions if their words are to be believed. And also on austerity, we've heard a lots of lambasting of the UK government today and of the Labour Party about on austerity. But again, if you look at the Fiscal Commission, they're very clear that they recommend in order to create the oil fund that the SNP were wanting to, to create, that they were in support of a downward trajectory on spending, on deficit reduction. Downward trajectory. That means austerity to everybody else in the chamber. So not just now. The, so the reality is on austerity as well. The rhetoric is strong. But the reality is somewhere different. So we've heard six billion cuts in welfare, not one penny more. We've heard condemnation of austerity, but nothing more. And then we have the criticism of the Smith. In fact, apart from Colin Beattie, who at the end said he warmly welcomed the new powers on welfare, which was a great, refreshing contribution to the debate, because so many others have derided um, the Smith Commission before even the legislation has been published later on uh, this week. Um, but we are going to create, for the first time, a £2.5 billion, in fact, a £3 billion Scottish welfare system for the first time ever. So will we be able to test the rhetoric and the actions to see if we do get the changes in the policy that this side have said that they want to deliver and find the money in order to pay for it? Because these things all cost. So we had the contrast in the debate. We had the contrast of the great, thoughtful contributions of the members I've already talked about, and then the rather depressing contributions on welfare, austerity and more powers. So let's return to the central point, and I've got Kevin Stewart to thank for this, because we've now got clarity that the SNP are opposed to the £800 tax cut that the UK Government has introduced, because he condemned it. In fact, Rod Campbell condemned it as well. So we can only conclude from that that they were opposed, that they would not, not just now, that they would not have introduced the cut to tax that this government has introduced, which has helped low- and middle-income earners by £800 a year. That is a significant benefit to people who are struggling to make ends meet. And on childcare, I think we also need to see a greater contribution, a greater effort from this government to increase childcare in the same way as the UK government has done down south. National minimum wage, remember it's been increased. So there's an extra £355 in the pocket of a full-time worker on minimum wage. 168,000 jobs have been created since this government came to power. These are all significant benefits, none of which were praised by the members on the SNP benches. Because in order to create that fairness that we're trying to generate within society, you do need that stronger economy and that fairer society. But I want to finish where Ken McIntosh started off. He talked about 20 th this, seconds. International, this international challenge that we have got. And I think it is worth reflecting that this country, this country is managing to meet the UN obligation, the 0.7% of GDP. And I think that's something that every person in this chamber should be proud of. The fact that we are contributing to poverty, challenging poverty, right across the globe. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, Colin, Annabel Goldie, up to seven minutes, please. Um, Dear Presiding Officer, <clears throat> this has been a, a contrasting debate of many shades of opinion, some predictable, and yet some unexpected, and perhaps from unexpected parts of the chamber. But I want to just set the backdrop we are emerging stronger from one of the most significant economic downturns of modern times, the most challenging financial period in 60 years. 
there are still huge challenges, but today we have a growing economy, delivering growing employment, created from skilled, good quality, full-time jobs. As the Minister herself said, youth employment is at a five-year low. We have rising wages and controlled inflation. Now, I think that's a very solid basis on which to approach the testing and perplexing issue of inequalities. And people are keeping more of their earnings with the increased income tax personal allowance. That is a tax cut for 2.3 million people in Scotland, and it takes 242,000 low-paid workers out of paying income tax altogether. I want to see these numbers increase, as they will from April this year, and hopefully go beyond that. Now, these policies of aspiration and opportunity, I think, are how we address inequality. And they are in sharp contrast with the Scottish Government's relentless focus on, on a paradox, which really Rennie has quite rightly identified. On the one hand, the Scottish Government indicates in word that it wants a higher, unquantified and apparently uncontrolled spend and welfare. But as Willie Rennie says, that is never actually borne out by specific spend commitment anywhere, either in their uh, pre-referendum documentation or their welfare uh, commission report. To say, and I quote, there has been very little change in income inequality since 1998 would jar with the contributions of many members today, particularly from the government benches. But that is a direct quote from the Scottish Government's most recent poverty and income, eco, income inequality in Scotland publication. Now, I have to say that I thought Christine Graham and Duncan McNeil thoughtfully reflected on the long-standing, enduring nature of inequalities, their diverse form and their complexity. And I felt there was an honesty in doing that, recognising there is no single bullet, because economic inequality trends are increasingly uh, global. And Scotland has clearly seen less of an increase in economic inequality than other countries. The Institute for Fiscal Studies has acknowledged that most industrialised countries saw increases in inequality between the mid-1980s and the late uh, 2000s. Now, the government's motion also refers to a £6 billion welfare cuts figure, a figure produced perhaps inevitably and predictably by the Scottish Government's own analysis after the last budget in July 2014. But its own welfare paper, from where this figure originates, admits that by a considerable margin, the biggest saving was made by the changing of benefits up rating from the retail price index to the consumer price index. So the Scottish Government motion is particularly bizarre, given that the Scottish Government's pre-referendum welfare report supported the use of the consumer price index rather than the retail price index. And another large saving identified by the Scottish Government's analysis was in changes to child benefit entitlement. Now, this was a tapered reduction for families where one person has an income of over £50,000, reducing to zero child benefit for earners over £60,000. Now, again, Deputy Presiding Officer, I don't recall the SNP campaigning on a platform of restoring child benefit for some of the top earners in our country. And I'd be interested to hear what they believe the impact of this cut has been on inequality. In combination, these two areas account for more than half of the £6 billion figure, savings that the SNP hasn't lifted a finger to oppose. And this is true of a number of other changes that fall under the umbrella of welfare reform. My colleague, Mr Johnson's amendment, uh, Mr. Johnson's amendment also touches on the conclusions of the Finance Committee's report last week. £500 million was voted by this Parliament to make a real shift towards preventative spend which is a good thing, in order to support a transition across public services, away from dealing with the symptoms of disadvantage and inequality towards tackling the root causes, something we all approve of. And yet, despite this, the committee has concluded that this project across the three trade change funds has produced, and I quote, a lack of measurable outcomes and has expressed concerns over a lack of progress. So where the Scottish Government has real powers to end inequalities in education, to which um, uh, Christina McKelvey, uh, or rather health, to which she referred, we, we see a great deal of talk, but little achievement. I mean, Mr McIntosh rightly referred to education. We have lost 140,000 college places in Scotland, and yet further education colleges are a vital component of building vocational skills, allowing people to return to education to prepare them for the workplace. And in access to university, 
In Scotland, the most disadvantaged are now the most excluded. England is doing better than we are in Scotland. And in health, we have seen not only the problems with the change fund, but a real terms cut to the health budget, while that same budget is growing in Scotland. Now, that's just a reality check, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I know from the murmurs it doesn't uh, suit the government benches to hear these observations. I do, welcome, I do welcome the Scottish Government's conclusion that work should be a route out of poverty, and Mr Neil and I agree on that. That is a priority. But what the Scottish Government seems to have failed to address is opportunity. The opportunities presented by job creation, the opportunities provided by education and skills, the opportunity for positive intervention by the NHS, such as using um, health visitors and improving health education, um, all issues controlled by this Parliament and all issues directly affecting constituents to whom, for example, Margaret McCulloch referred. I have to say I thought Roderick Campbell made an eloquent plea for these devolved issues, for example, health education, to have much more focused attention. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government has become a ritual critic of the uh, United Kingdom Government. Indeed, that is the Scottish Government's default position whenever it is confronted by any challenge. But the reality is you draw to a close, please. an inert passive Scottish Government, blind to opportunity and failing across a whole range of devolved issues for which it's been responsible for the last eight years. The Scottish Government should take a long, hard, collective look in the mirror and start finding answers. I support the amendment in Alec Johnson's name. Thanks so much. Now, Colin Neil Finney, eight minutes or thereby. Hey, thanks, President Officer. I, I'm going to uh, give you a recipe today, President Officer, not for a nice cake or a dish, uh, but a recipe cooked up by the world's economic gurus over the last 30 or so years, a recipe that has created an economic system where wealth and power are transferred to, accumulated then, hoarded by a small, rich, powerful elite, whilst at the same time the mass of people have seen their power, wealth and influence stolen from them. That system of uh, neoliberal economics as a theory, an uh, ideology, some might say a religion which exists to create inequality. That's its purpose. A system where the market is king, where competition decides everything, where global markets are opened up to so-called free trade and only the fittest survive. Of course, um, Thatcher and Reagan, no doubt heroes of Mr Johnson, were uh, the greatest disciples, and he, I, I see him nodding in agreement, were, uh, no surprise there, were the greatest disciples of, not, not just now, of this philosophy, true believers in the market's ability to answer every problem irrespective of the consequences. And in the UK, the Thatcher government withdrew state subsidy from the car and the steel and the shipbuilding and other industries, preferring to see people parked on unemployment or incapacity benefit in communities destroyed rather than see the state interfere in her beloved market. She created a narrative that said that wealth accumulation was how you measured success. Individualism and materialism was good. Collectivism and communitarianism bad. Unemployment became a method of social control setting worker against worker in a competition for new low-paid, deregulated, semi- and unskilled service sector work. And home ownership was promoted as the barometer of personal success. Council housing sold off at discount and people encouraged to take mortgages at four, five, and six times their salary, then to use credit cards and loans to finance their lifestyle. Move from being paid weekly to monthly left many needing a regular overdraft or exorbitant payday loans to get them to the end of the month. And this along with mass unemployment and a systematic crackdown on organised labour ensured nothing stood in the way of this project. And low paid homeowners up to their ears in debt, fearing for their job at a time of mass unemployment, would not go on strike to defend their jobs and conditions. And those who promoted and created this system knew it. We saw our public assets flogged off to the deregulated city and people making fortunes out of our gas and electricity and telecoms industries that were once ours. All the time, rich individuals, hedge funds and finance houses grew fatter and fatter on the spoils as corporate power milked this approach for all it was worth. And I'd say this not to give anyone a history lesson. We all know the story, but we have to understand today's debate against that context. Um, 
I agree that having a sustainable and secure economy is vital for the well-being of society, but what is essential in this debate is having the political will to ensure that the benefits of our economy are shared more equitably and progressively amongst all our people, not just those at the top. Mr. Stewart. Kevin Stewart. Uh, Mr. Finlay has given us a, a wee history lesson there, but it's a bit like 1984 in terms of the rewriting of history, because he for forgets the neoliberal agenda of Blairism, because neoliberalism was entrenched in Blairism, was it not? Mr. Finlay. I never uh, forgot about that, Mr Stewart, because I was one of its biggest critics also. And I am prepared to say that. And that's the difference between you and I, Mr Stewart. Because where my party get things wrong, I am willing to say so. None of the sheep on those benches are ever willing to do so. Not one of the sheep. Look at them. And let me say this. All right. OK. I welcome uh, some of the speeches today. I thought... Christine Graham's speech was excellent, and I think many of the issues that she raised in relation to prisoners, we could also uh, raise in relation to young people leaving care. I thought Rhoda Grant made an excellent speech on health inequalities, and Duncan McNeill's speech is one of the best speeches I've heard in this parliament, uh, and I don't give Duncan McNeill many compliments, I'm sure he'll agree. <laughs> Only joking, Duncan. Um, uh, but his, his speech was a challenge to each and every one of us, and I think uh, we should hear more speeches like that in this Parliament. I also commend Cara Hilton's comments on education, but of course those were serious speeches, but we had knockabout also, and um, we uh, heard uh, Christina McKelvey, uh, I don't know if she's backing up, she is back in her place, um, uh, mention the uh, uh, last Labour government well, and asking what they, they did for working people and trade unions. Well, let me Taylor, we introduced the minimum wage, we introduced the social, uh, brought in the social chapter, extended parental rights, increased, co increased compensation for unfair dismissal, gave a legal right to trade union representation. Yeah, yeah. And when elected in May, we'll take action on zero hours contracts, low pay agency workers, the quality of apprenticeships, blacklisting, bogus self employment, Order. pay differentials, and a whole lot more that the trade unions have called for and have been part of our policy process in writing. Christina McKelvey. Maybe after that big list of stuff that the Labour Party promised the last time in their manifesto and didn't deliver, Mr, Mr. 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 Finlay can tell us which specific trade union piece of legislation brought in by Margaret Thatcher did Tony Blair overturn any of it? Neil Finlay. Well, Ms McKelvey looks at the looks at our party's own record, they promised to overturn none of that either. So maybe she wants to have a look at her own party rather than criticise others. And of course, and of course, Ken McIntosh was right to challenge the minister, who, appear, who appears didn't know that this parliament is getting taxation powers to see if the SNP will implement a 50p top tax rate. Maybe Maybe Mr Neil and summing up, uh, Mr Neil, an ex-socialist who once believed in redistribution, maybe he'll be able to tell us. Uh, and maybe he'll be able to tell us if they believe in the bankers' bonus tax to fund youth unemployment initiative. Do they support the mansion tax to fund extra nurses in our LNHS? Because I think we know the answer to that, presiding officer. The answer is no. So much for the progressive policies of the SNP. Mind you, it was the backbench member for Aberdeen East who said he didn't mind Thatcherite economics. Three policies that we have put forward, taking money from the wealthy to create jobs and put cash into the pockets of working people, and they don't support any of them. And of course, what has been the main redistributive policy of the SNP in recent years? A policy to cut corporation taxes to one of the lowest rates and the European Union. This is why we are critical and sceptical of the Scottish Government's rhetoric. And Willie Rennie close, was please. right to point out that not an extra penny was promised in the White Paper. And of course this week we will see the Scottish Government's own staff in this very building and outside it going on strike over low pay. And I am glad the Culture Secretary is here. She has had a dispute in her own directorate for over a year where £3,000 uh, 3, will be taken off the lowest paid staff and weekend allowances, and nothing has happened for a year. Close, Only today, please. as Cara Hilton mentioned, we see the PCS union highlighting how members of Scot the Scottish Government staff 
are relying on credit and food banks to get through the month. We need a change of philosophy and a change of approach across government to tackle these issues. Thanks so much. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary, Alec Neil, to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have until five o'clock. Thank you very much indeed, De Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I first of all just say to Willie Rennie that to Rosanna Cunningham and I are members of the 99 group but would not describe ourselves as old stagers. <laughs> Uh, and can I just also say to Mr Finlay, he says I'm an ex-socialist. Mr Finlay's just ex, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, let me begin by putting on the record, uh, presiding officer, that the government won't be accepting any of the amendments today. Now, I do think, I do think there is a degree of unanimity in the chamber that the level of poverty in Scotland and indeed the level of poverty elsewhere in the UK and in the wider world is uh, totally unacceptable. Uh, some of the statistics have already been mentioned about Scotland, 19% of our population, 1 million people in Scotland living in poverty. One figure that hasn't been mentioned is that out of that 230,000 are living in severe poverty. 59% of children in poverty are living in a household where somebody is in work. And of course, our disabled community have suffered the most in recent years, and many of them are particularly living in poverty. And whether, I will in a minute, and whether the uh, measure is educational attainment or the gap in life expectancy between the wealthier and poorer parts of our society, I hope we would all agree that although the UK is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the OECD, it is totally unacceptable that we have the fourth ranking for the level of poverty across the United Kingdom throughout the whole of the OECD. That is totally unacceptable acceptable for an economy as rich as the UK to have the fourth largest level of poverty in the whole of the OECD. Uh, thanks, Ken McIntosh. For giving way. Uh, I think there has been broad agreement across the Chamber this afternoon about the problem of inequality in this country and our desire to tackle it. On that note, uh, the, the Labour benches are prepared to vote for the SNP amendment. What's wrong with the Labour amendment that the SNP will not vote for it? What works? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there's a number of things wrong with it, and I'll come to that in a minute. But can I first of all say we've got to look at why poverty has got so much worse uh, over the last few years. And I have to say to both the Tories and the Liberal Democrats that they do hold responsibility for this. And there are four or five major contributing factors. But before I go into them, presiding officer, it's easy to band around statistics and to make uh, points about various measures and so on. But at the end of the day, what poverty is about is human misery. Now, I suspect, like many other MSPs in this chamber, I could reel off literally hundreds of examples of my constituents coming into my surgery to tell me about the desperate financial state they and their families find themselves in. Quite recently, I had a visit from a single mother who had three children, all of whom had autism, and the Department of Work and Pensions had left her with £18 that week to look after her and her children. I find that totally unacceptable in 2015. We were able to get her to a food bank. We were able to get her emergency money to see her through the weekend. We were able to get her fixed up with welfare rights to see if she was getting everything she was entitled to. But because of various measures taken by the Department of Work and Pensions, that family was left with £18 to live on. And there are too many examples of that. George Adam, for example, referred to the implication and the consequences of sanctioning uh, by the Department of Work and Pensions. That is now a major cause of short-term poverty in Scotland, the sanctioning of people who are already down at the heel in terms of their income and their ability to make ends meet from week to week. And I would hope that when we get the transfer of additional powers over welfare, I hope we get control over issues like that, because it's many of these issues that are causing so much hardship to our people. If you look at the benefit changes in recent years, 
Most of those have not been reforms. They've been cuts to benefits for people who are the most vulnerable members of our society. That's a major contributing factor to the increase in poverty. The fact that the minimum wage hasn't kept level with inflation is a major contributing factor to in-work poverty. And that happened both under Labour and the coalition government. And public spending cuts, cuts to housing, cut, I will it, cuts to housing, cuts to a whole range of policy areas, then passed on to Scotland, has been a major contributing factor to poverty. And it is utterly deplorable, it is utterly deplorable that on top of the existing cuts that the Labour Party joined the Tories and the Liberals in voting for another £30 billion of cuts. So, when, presiding officer, when I hear lip service from Ken McIntosh and Neil Finlay saying they care about the poor, if they care about the poor, condemn that vote the other night in the House of Commons. I'll take Mr Johnson. Alex Johnson. It's not ironic that the Cabinet Secretary talks about cuts to the housing budget when his own government sought to target the housing budget for disproportional cuts year on year, and it was only the Barnett Consequentials that allowed him to reverse part of that cut. Cabinet Secretary. Targeted for disproportional cuts as a block grant from your government in Westminster to the Scottish Government. We have, be, we have seen our capital budget slice to ribbons by 26 per cent over recent years and the resource budget cut in real terms by 10 per cent. If our budget is cut by 10 per cent and 26 per cent on capital, we have to live within our means. And if it hadn't been for all the work of John Swinney, the Scottish Futures Trust and all the other initiatives we have taken, we wouldn't be building the number of houses we're building now in Scotland every year. Can I, um, can I also say, I want to also, no, can I also say that um, I want to mention this point about the income tax cuts. Because the Tories and the Liberals make a big issue about the increase in the personal allowance. They forget to tell us on the day they started cutting the personal allowance, the increased value added tax from 17.5% to 20%. That is a regressive tax. That means it hits the poorest more than the wealthiest. So the Liberals and the Tories have no excuse. The impact of the rise in VAT on poorer people was far greater than the benefit from any cut in the personal allowance. So the reality is, presiding officer, over the last four or five years under the coalition and over the previous 13, and let me say to Kevin Stewart, Kevin Stewart was a bit inaccurate when he said just that Blair was a guru of what Mr Finlay called neoliberal economics. Blair wasn't the only Labour guru. Gordon Brown was a neoliberal. Peter Mandelson was a neoliberal. And Jim Murphy was a neoliberal economist as well. So we won't be taking any lessons. The only one in the Scottish Labour Party who isn't a neoliberal is Katie Clark, who courageously voted against the cuts the other night in the House of Commons. And unlike Mr Finlay, she has stuck to the promises she made in the leadership election for the Labour Party. Now, they ask, us, need to wind up. they ask us about what we are doing. In conclusion, presiding officer, let me remind the chamber what we are doing to tackle poverty. We're implementing the living wage. We're implementing the rise for NHS workers. We're going to be spending nearly £300 million on welfare mitigation. We're investing in public services. We'll get free prescription, free school meals, free higher education. We have kept the educational maintenance allowance. We're increasing childcare. We're extending eligibility for childcare. We'll get perfect modern apprenticeships and a whole range of other things we are doing, presiding officer. They pay lip service 
we act on poverty and inequality. That concludes the debate on tackling inequalities. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 12096. In the name of Richard Lockhead, on the Public Bodies Abolition of Homegrown Timber Advisory Committee Order 2015 UK Legislation. And I call on Richard Lockhead to move the motion. Cabinet Secretary. Formally moved. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is Amendment number 12095.4 in the name of Ken McIntosh, which seeks to amend motion number 12095. In the name of Alex Neal, on tackling inequalities, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cancel votes now. Vote on amendment number 12095.4 in the name of Ken McIntosh is as follows. Yes, 30. No, 80. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Can I remind members that in relation to today's debates, if the amendment in the name of Alex Johnson is agreed, the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie falls. The next question then is amendment number 12095.2 in the name of Alex Johnson, which seeks to amend motion number 12095 in the name of Alex Neal on tackling inequalities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote are amendment number 12095.2 in the name of Alex Johnson is as follows. Yes, 14. No, 97. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 12095.1 in the name of Willie Rennie, which seeks to amend motion number 12095 in the name of Alex Neal on tackling inequalities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cancel votes now. The result of the vote are amendment number 12095.1 in the name of Willie Rennie is as follows. Yes, 18. No, 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12095 in the name of Alex Neal on tackling inequalities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members to cast the votes now.
The result of the vote on motion number 12095 in the name of Alex Neil is as follows. Yes, 93. No, 18. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 12096 in the name of Richard Lockhead on the public body's abolition of the homegrown Timber Advisory Committee Order 2015 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly. <laughs>